Hello. Hello. I'm going to scare you. <laughs> <laughs> I have my I Hamilton's here with us today. Oh, look at he. Right, he's going to be doing his own show and tell. <laughs> is he going to tell us about those badass raccoons that keep, keeps partying with at night? I can't believe you had four of those suckers in your house. <laughs> I was like, I can't believe you leave your door open. Well, I, well, I don't have a choice. I don't have a cat fox. Well, they can, they'll meow if they want out. Oh, I'm going to wake up at three in the morning to let them out. <laughs> well, you're waking up at three in the morning to see the raccoons. Well, what's happened is I've turned the light on in the, in the kitchen breezeway and, and they haven't come in. Really? So, well, the food has been moved. It's yeah. all, it's been moved out for a long time, but. Uh, <laughs> but turning on the light. I've been that turning on the light, light in the kitchen. So the, that, that area of the kitchen yeah. that that walkway that breezeway has a has a light on just like if we're up and wandering around and so far there hasn't been any raccoon prints or anything when i've come in the really? door i i hope it's just that simple but the other day i, <laughs> I before i went to bed because i only turned it on before i go to bed and um i was i heard something i don't know you just get used to knowing yeah. your sounds in your house and then I, I heard something and I'm here where I'm at right now. I turn on my camera, the one that's in there, and I saw a yellow cat at the food bowl. And I thought, that's Imogen. That doesn't quite look like Imogen. <laughs> so, I, so I said something because you can talk through the, the app and the cat freaked out, ran out. And then I looked and Imogen was sleeping next to me. So there was a yellow cat eating out of the food bowl because I hadn't turned on the light and I hadn't moved the food bowls yet. So, you know, I'm not so worried about another, but hamilton here brilliant hamilton i come around the corner and he's sitting there going watching the cat eat his food <laughs> as long as you're lucky cat, the, you're lucky the raccoons didn't go further into your house like we never do we've raccoons. always had a, we've always had some sort of problem with raccoons or opossums or something getting into the house and they've never moved past that entryway i have a I feeling they, they don't, don't want to get trapped into the house for the oh home. maybe it yeah it goes too far they're clever little guys, I tell oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> but if turning the lights on solves it, that's a, I mean, that's a really good deal. I know I was thinking to Mark, I can't, we can't go out, of, we can't together go out of the house. I mean, at yeah. night, because we'd have to lock up the cat food. We'd have to have somebody come over in the morning, yeah. open the cats, the door so the cats could get into the food and then at night, shut it back. I don't want to deal with that. So yeah. I thought I'll just, I got to keep trying something or one of us always has to stay. The and night. they haven't, they haven't like tried to get into your cupboards. That surprises me. Never tried to get, there's fruit on the counter. They've never tried it. They've never, you know, if you have cookies or something out, no. And they never, pa they never venture past that little area. So if there was food on the floor, they wouldn't need it. Just have you even had things out in, yeah. in the kitchen and they didn't get it? Fruit. Fruit. Well, they're uh, just well behaved. They're very well bred. These guys. <laughs> they only want Imes cat food. It's, oh. it's it's for their it's digestive. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah balls and, <laughs> and it's elder but cat. It's do they cat. not go into your kitchen part of your kitchen either? No, they never go out of that breezeway. I've never seen footprints because they go in and they get to the cat bowl where the yeah. water is, and they'll put their paws in the water pause yeah they have pause and they get them all cleaned and then they kind of make footprints all over the rest of the walkway and it has a musty smell in there yeah. and never i found prints past the breezeway or into the kitchen or into the hallway it must be, you're right it must be a, a, a not wanting to leave line of sight for escape yeah yeah, I've seen them get into the small bathroom before years, years yeah. ago, they'd get into the small bathroom. There was one time I heard a noise and I got up and I was by myself or Sterling was living here and I, and I was so scared. I put my phone on record and I put it around the corner <laughs> with a video of it somewhere. And then I'm like this playing around, like moving my phone like this. And then all of a sudden the rec, it was in the, the small bathroom and got into the small bathroom 
not because there was cat food there, but probably because it heard me coming and it didn't know what to do. And it got into that area. And then all of a sudden it jumps or does something. And I, and on the video, you can hear me go scream, go, ah! <laughs> and then I pull the phone in, close the door, and I'm looking at the video going, what is it in there? It was a raccoon. But it was a small Those were big suckers on your last video. How in the heck did they get in there? Just fluffy, I guess. Yeah, and four of them. Well, if they, I, I was, I had just gone to bed and I was just going to sleep. And I said, what is that noise? And I said, oh, I think we have a raccoon. And, and none of I, them were little babies either. No babies. And so I, it was like one, two, wait, three, there's a four. <laughs> I, was, I was just laughing. Couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> I was just like, what are you guys doing in there? <laughs> I'm like, get out of my house. <laughs> I was laughing. Oh, it's just hilarious. It's, and the cats never go close if the raccoons are in there. They no. never, they, they will just sit and I don't know what they're doing. They're somewhere. They're probably in the other part of the kitchen sleeping because we've blocked off our um, dining room and the living room. We're keeping that a lot cleaner now you know, because the cats aren't in there unless right. somebody's there with them, like, you know, sitting with them on the couch. Hello, Ariadne. Would you like to come and say That's hello? That's what I do with mine because I'm so tired. The front is mine. I just started now mm -hmm. that there's just one. In the evening, I close the bedroom doors and he can be in the living room in the front of the house with me sitting next to me on the couch under supervision. Yeah, that's uh, how it is with our cats now. And yeah. we were finding this one pukes, but she has been so good. She hasn't been puking lately. Or if she sure. is, I, I haven't found it. Yeah. And, and she hasn't been peeing all over the house either. So I guess the problem seems to be solved, but we still don't put any blankets, towels, rugs on the floor where she could pee on them because she thinks you put a towel down, that's, yeah. she's got to pee on In it. In fact, Michaela started doing that when, because Chet for a while was being bad and intentionally just leaving a towel down at night. Mm -hmm. So if he's going to go, at least go there. And don't I did go. that too. Yeah, it's so weird. It worked perfect. It was like perfect. I would, I'd go to bed, lock the food away. And as we got more and more savvy, we learned that the food and the food bin that held the food and the bags that hold the food all have to go. Those raccoons are clever. They knew that inside that bag, there was um, food and inside the can, that's a five gallon can, they knew it. So then I would fold up a towel put it out there for her to pee on. And every morning, right on the towel, it was peed on and that was it. And I could see her coming and going outside. Yeah. So she was having no problem. It's just that she thought I must pee on that little towel. This is riveting, riveting video that we're making right now. <laughs> yeah, it is on video, huh? Did Cindy, you get it Cindy out of your ottoman? Hmm? Did you get it out of your ottoman? Mm -hmm. Good. Took a while. We had to soak that puppy and leave it in the sun for a very long time. Oh, you should see what I'm doing. You got to come over to the house and see what we're doing now. Tomorrow, I'm going to be working on it more. But Tuesdays when we get our pod, and uh, so everything it's has Tuesday. to be done. Wow. So, so everything has to be done. And yesterday, Mark and I. Oh my gosh, we tore. Well, you can see stuff out in the front of the house. People have been taking everything but the big stuff but I've got a chair out there and I've got a barbecue pit. If it doesn't get taken, I'll just bring it back in. But yeah. I have, um, in my garage, I had these big metal storage uh, shelves that are, go up to the roof. So like 10 feet, something like that. And they've had just stuff on them, you know, and I keep cleaning them out. But the problem is, is that when we put them in against the wall, there, we didn't have drywall back behind them. Yeah, It's just the open beams. So, things would constantly fall behind and then it's just filthy. You know, you just can't get the clean. And so I said, well, when they're doing this project, I want drywall put it all over an insulation. So yeah. I took everything out and it's sitting out in my backyard on where I usually keep my trash cans and my trash cans are now in the front of the house because we're not gonna be able to get to our trash cans for yeah. at least a month if we leave them in the backyard. So my backyard is full of that little staging areas of stuff where I've got a table spread out and I'm starting to sort stuff on. And, and so I just took the, we took everything off of one cabinet, moved the metal cabinet. We had to lay it down to get it to fit out the door. And Mark and I are just sweating. It was hilarious. I'm like, come on, we could do it. Just four of them. Yeah. Brought them out into the backyard, swept them all off, cleaned off the cobwebs, put all the items back on it. And then went yeah. inside and put, did the same thing. We take everything off, put it onto the first cabinet, so bring it out. Empty everything out of the garage and the room behind the garage? 
not everything. Everything has to come out of the rafters, most of the rafters, yeah. not all of them. And um, Tuesday, the pod comes and there'll be two guys to, we have two hours for each of them. And they're going to help get the furniture into the pod. Oh, that'll be nice. And move the cabinets that are bigger. But all the little stuff has to go. It has to be packaged or it has to be put or it just got to go. So. And your pod's not going to be in way of the uh, the materials coming in and out for construction? It's only going to be like half, like a car size, size of a car, okay. maybe a little bit bigger than a car. Yeah. And then once that's, and then we only want to keep it for a month. So it's really only going to hold the furniture that's in the yeah. middle of my garage, but I've got a whole side of the cat of the garage partly completely cleaned out. It feels really. So when does nice. the guys start working on it? The following Saturday, so Tuesday the pod people come. The like pod. next Saturday, a week, a week from Saturday, mm -hmm. a week from this Saturday. Wow. Yeah, and then he says that he and his buddy should be able to get the frame built and the hole cut in the wall and um, the drywall started, and then I think he's going to come back during the week. Because they'll work on the weekend from like six in the seven in the morning till three. And then they'll, um, he thinks he'll come in and he'll start on the um, electrical because I want outlets put in mm -hmm. and some of the fine tuning. And then I think the friend comes back the following weekend and they finish. And then I think they'll be done. And then what I will do is I have the tile or whatever I'm going to do yeah. on the floor, put the cabinets in. He's going to help me. I have a big cabinet, a big cabinet that came from my in laws. And it's bright yellow. And tomorrow I plan on dragging that out. I might cut it because it has this huge bookcase, really big bookcase. I think I'm going to cut it off because it's attached to a drawers that don't open well. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to cut that off and I'm going to sand it and paint it. And then oh. that's going to go up on my, because um, I'm making an off, uh, like a shop. Yeah. And I think that's going to be part of my shop. And my... You're going to love this. Do you like those little plastic bins that are my, my friend brought? I like me. anything that's organized. It is. So those little plastic bins, they're bright red I have. Uh -huh. I don't know if I have a picture of them. But anyway, he gave me a whole bunch of them yesterday. I went and got them. And he's, he says he's got about 100 more. His workplace is throwing everything out. And What so are they they're, from? They're like those plastic bins that you put sort stuff in. And they're, they're different sizes. They're like this size, this size, and real narrow. Like the kind that would be in a, like a, a parts department? Yes. Wow. Exactly. So wow. he's got, he says he's probably got a hundred more. As they're getting empty, um, emptying um, them, he's got them. So if you, if you think he'd like those, but I think they're, I think you could put little shelving rails in yeah, a bookcase or something slide to down. slide them in and make them height wise. So I've got about probably really sturdy 30. too mm -hmm. i've got about 30 so that's why i want to paint this cabinet because it's bright yellow and i think i'm going to paint it a dark gray so that yeah. the red bins will look nice in there because you know like why like are you cutting the cabinet? Hmm? why are you cutting the cabinet because it's it's weird somebody made it it's it's a really sturdy bookcase but it's built on a on doors below on on drawers so it's like a flat area with oh. drawers underneath it yeah. and then it's got a bookcase so yeah. you could sit on it if you wanted to it's a really sturdy cabinet you should come see it and tell me what you, you just think. want the bookcase part of it not the yeah because the drawers are then they, they don't they're old you know they're not they're not I'd, I'd have to put yeah. gliders on them and i don't even know where i'd put something like this it's kind of a i don't know maybe it's maybe it's worth it to keep it do you know anything about putting drawers like the sliding drawers making them so that they fit like gliding. Yeah, I mean, it kind of depends on how the 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 doors constructed. I just got rid of like fifty of those glides. I still might have some. But you know, any, do you know how to do it or what to do or? Uh, in theory, I've never done it. But often, what you have to do is build up the um, the inside of you know, like you have to put a piece of wood on the inside of the walls of the chest part so that that can hold the glide and the glide can come in and out. So it really depends on whether or not the drawers, you know, some drawers are like this and they move in and out. Yeah. Some drawers have a, a bit of an offset oh. with a lip. If they're like this and move in and out, then you, you don't have any room to put the glide on because the drawer is gonna be the width of the drawer plus the width of the glide. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So it depends on the size of the drawers and the side of the glide. Yeah. I don't know. Come by tomorrow if you're not busy and okay. see what I'm doing. I wonder if I could have um, the Azevedo's, uh, Anthony Azevedo, he's a carpenter. I wonder if maybe it. I could have yeah. him do it if it's something that looks like but the question open. is, is but do I even want those drawers? Is it going to get in the way? I mean, is, is having something that opens that low in the way of your shop space versus something that's just up and down? You know? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not really sure um, until I get into it. But I really want to have the cabinet painted and ready to go so that I can screw when it into the wall. In. And I'm just going to, I know what's going to happen is I'm going to want to just get that damn thing done. Where's everybody at? I have no idea. Are not that ready? I don't mind talking to you, but where in the heck is everybody? I don't know. It's Thursday. Last I checked, it is. Boy, I've been confused a lot this year <laughs> i know it's like how do you distinguish cindy calls me on wednesdays and i know it's wednesday and that that is the day the before the next she says she'll be here too oh okay and so i know Cindy. i know where cindy is she's having another oh process. and uh deirdre's in tahoe oh so we're just waiting for mary yeah hamilton you're up come on him Tamberly's right here. She's waiting. Oh, yeah. you know what? If anybody wants it too, I have that PDF from Michaela. Um, essentially, her sh the slideshow, but I don't know. Ooh, if it makes I would like to see it again because that was really interesting. So then you can. So it had to be put in Google Drive because it's so freaking big. She couldn't email it. Really. And what I. I felt like I got this. I could do this. And then she started showing the pictures of ours we sent. And I thought, I, I don't know if I got this. <laughs> so I see it in my Google Drive. How do I um, share, share with other people? Share. Should be an option for sharing. Share with me recent starred trash news. I don't like Google Drive. It's always so confusing, but I have. Tons of stuff that people send me on Google Drive. Oh, I right click on it and I share it. So, so my email, my Google email is, is, uh, well, I guess you could use Susan Gerbeck at gmail.com. That's, that's Susan Gerbeck at gmail.com. Yeah. Is there a dot between your first and second name? No. That should work. I, I have one I use much more often, but I guess it would work with Susan Gerbeck. I mean, I guess we could start. We're recording this, and and Deirdre could watch, and I know t I know Cindy wants to watch, but I don't want to go. You know, watch what? All of our amazing stuff that we have for, for show and tell. Don't you have a ton? I have. I do not. I have done nothing. I I was finishing up a baby blanket this week, and now I. Who's got a baby? I'm a little Dustin, baby. Dustin's baby in October. Oh. Uh, and now I am sewing new cushion covers for a friend's outdoor furniture. That sounds good. What are you weaving? I don't see anything on there. I don't have anything on, but I have, I'm getting ready. So I'm taking an online class mm -hmm. in gradients on how you, uh, instead of stripes, how you can gradually move from one color into the next with these four colors. Oh, wow. Is that a dark brown? I don't, can't tell what that it's, is. Yeah, it's uh, burnt umber. And these four and how to put them all into some napkins, so. Well, you had something that you were doing last time that we saw you. Did you finish it? On the loom? Yeah, you said that you were doing something for an online class. I thought it was actually- Oh, yeah, I did. I made a, a, a table runner. Well, I made it a scarf, but it I don't like it for a scarf, so it's a table runner on my front table. That was a class in how you stash bust, essentially, how you take a whole bunch of random stuff that you have, little bits of, and figure out a way to make it work when it's not all the different size. It's really cool. This, this, this group has a... Um, link me on to a website of, you know, there's all sorts of weaving websites where you can get, you know, the drafts, like how you set stuff up. Mm -hmm. But this one goes through and, you know, with weaving it, it's, 
you've got colors going this way, but you have colors going this way. So where these colors cross, depending on how they go, that's a different color. Oh my gosh, that sounds And it lets you go and um, like either take screenshots of your yarn, or if you know the RGB code, mm -hmm. enter the RGB code of all the different yarns, and then you can go and say, okay, I want all of these threads to be pink, then I want these to be blue, so you can on the screen, see how the colors interact with each other and move stuff around. It's really cool. So this is this is only because we have computers that can figure these things out. Oh, right? wow. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd be graph paper and colored pencils <laughs> redoing it. RB, RBG colors is um, uh, like really if you're at a photo right? program or something, you can click on a, um, there's a universally decided numbering system for color yeah there's the hex number and then there's the rbg number and then there's the the panatone okay so i'm just saying that just in case yeah. somebody watching this will be like oh. what's the rbg number but in the but in the uh color mixing world of um at least with threads it's we use the cyan magenta um yellow as the primaries like like printer ink does, right? Because yeah. those are really the true primaries, not red, green, and blue. So, yeah. But it's really cool. I mean, things like this, gal, is things I never spent much time looking into, but you can have bright colors if they're bright and they're, um, but they're close on the color wheel, they'll stay bright. Any kind of bright colors together will stay bright if they're, only within two segments of the color wheel. But the minute you put something of that third segment of the color wheel in with these two, everything goes muddy and brown. It's very weird. Yeah. And somehow your eye sees yellow before it sees anything else. And yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Like, I didn't know that either, but evidently your eye, that's why a little yellow goes a long way, but your eye will attract to the yellow before I didn't know that. Anything else? Hamilton, did you know that? <laughs> I've, I've been waiting for him to leave because I have my cheese stick. <laughs> <laughs> I had to sneak it in here. I had to hide it under a napkin because he'll hear that sucker open. He likes like, cheese. Meow, 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 meow. Where's my cheese uh, stick? So, so life has ended once he hears the, it's like a cat can food uh, opening up or can opener. Op it's, you know, it's the uh, lid of the little jar that I keep the cat treats in. <laughs> and the only way with Chet, he doesn't like, he won't take a, a cat treat out of your hand because of training when we started, because my floors are really slick, the bamboo floors in the back. So you take a cat treat and you slide it across the floor. <laughs> it goes like all the way to the back and he tears off after it. <laughs> it's a and game. Smack, oh, smacks into the table leg. It falls over and he grabs it. And... You should be videotaping that because oh God, then you, the that would be, you put that on TikTok. TikTok, you're an instant celebrity <laughs> right there. Slams yeah. into that door, just like totally slams into the door because he gets going, he can't stop on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> It's very entertaining. <laughs> Just like us. We are so entertaining. I see Netflix watching us right now. They're like, Tamberly and Susan. That, that, the Catalina too. And oh, then I we, could add in, we could add in the rest of our, our team and they'll be like, oh my gosh, Mary in North Carolina. You, did you see the rain that they're having over there? They had, they had flooding. They lost several people in a flood in North Carolina. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I, I was like, what? Taylor had the wettest wind, the wettest summer on record. Well, she'll have her apricots. Yeah. <laughs> not yeah. us. Not us over here. Well, I guess we can, let's start with all the stuff we have so that when, so I'm sure it's going to be. I'm still just doing that. Me thing. as you trying to systematically go through and collect all the census data I can on anyone going back on still all the working lines. on that. Yeah. It takes forever. Well, how far back are you going to uh, as far back as you can, or do you have a set group of people? Like you're working on a family tree. Are you, so are you starting from the oldest person you can possibly find and then finding the census data? I know because I've tried doing that with things and I'm into rabbit holes all over. I've I'm going back. Great, great. It, it's brother-in-law's families of 
who knows who. Well, I'm trying to collect just the the base family. So like I have my my great grandfather. Is he the farthest back you're going? Hmm? Is he the farthest back you're going? No, no. So if I have my great grandfather, then I record he and his family out because then I've got my grandfather, right? Mm -hmm. But now I know my grandfather's parents. So now I'm finding my grandfather's family and recording that. So then I know and then follow both of those back. It's harder on the women. So I'm doing it mostly on the men just because it's easier to start. Then I can dig with the women. But then I go back to the great grandfather and find out him before he was married, go back to his parents. So great, 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 great. I think I'm back to fourth grade or something. And are you gotten this far back one side? Which 70, side? 1790 census is where I've gotten back to. But then, you know, it gets really, it gets really hinky when, um, hinky, that's a, that's yeah. a trendy word. You know, it's it's trending is, all over TikTok now that you said it. Yeah. When, when, <laughs> when the census is changed to just name of head of household and then check the marks. marks. Yeah. Yeah. Cindy, Cindy did teach us how to do that. Yeah. But you're, 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 uh, it's hard. <laughs> a lot of supposition. Yeah. You would, yeah. you would go in quickly. You would explain yeah. how you would do the tick marks. So let me hear you, Tamberly, for the, for the purposes of Dare Dream Mary and Cindy, who will be watching this. So well, I regret right. that the tick marks as they are in the census by age group, you know, and it, depending on the census, it might be males zero to five, males five to 10, males five to four, free males five to 14, 14 to 25. And I mark those tick marks. So then you can, every 10 years, you can advance people up to the next bracket or back to the next bracket. They should age. be there. And should be some, there, but, but if it's missing, they might have died or moved out. But what I find is that when you when you get back that far, because you're just dealing with the for usually the first and last name of the male, sometimes if it's a female head of household and you've got what you think probably is the family because the 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 tick marks seem to go right to me, that time when it was just tick marks also overlaps when um, communities were smaller and more inbred. So there's a whole bunch of people with that last name and maybe with that first name in that small area, you know, or maybe, you know, in distinguishing between uh, the head of household and his uncle that has the same name, but lives in, so it's like, they're living closer and closer together with less and less information. Right. But, and then if somebody was to die, they would, like if a wife dies, and the husband's still alive, a lot of times the young children will go to live with a uncle or somebody with or a female to take care of somebody who can take yeah. care of the child. Yeah. And so, so it gets a little confusing. So you really have to uh, probably use other sources. Well, it, it, to me, once you get back that far, it's really, um, it, it becomes an interesting piece of information to use, but it's not you know, to maybe know what region you're looking at to start look at actual documents that would have names, you know, marriages and right. registers. Hopefully so somebody's done the family you know, story, the history go, in a book or something. When you go pretty far back though, like the, the you know, mid 1700s, early 1700s, it's like, it's like there's this information that's recent and then there's a glitch of a time when stuff is harder. But then when you go really back, it's like it gets, it's really a lot easier because maybe because there was there was less people and less information but town records of families town records of births all that seemed to be easier to get in those like 1700s and early 1700s than early 1800s or mid 1800s but i don't know if that's because mid 1800s is when the expansion happened and people weren't so centric in one area and I don't know. I don't well, know. What I was, when I'm doing the Jerry Andrus family history, which I started before I started the scanning process or even sorting process, they're in, you know, as you know, in Massachusetts, North Adams, a lot of them, and then they moved, some of them moved to Wyoming, but the records are so easy to find into this yeah. early 1800s, late 1700s. It's like I could probably even go well, with those things I sent you. I think Michaela just went on to online. I mean, it's a little podunk town, but online to the library online mm -hmm. and searched and found this stuff about 
somebody's well especially the east coast some but people have been really interested maybe it's because of the daughters of the american revolution possibly um people have done a lot of research um it seems that they they really wanted to prove their roots and so they 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 made these books they they took the history of the town and they copied all everything into something before i guess yeah. the courthouse burned down which just seems like always happened in arkansas and it was it was they're very they seemed very concerned about their family history not right like now we've just kind of like oh maybe because my, father, were, my great grandfather was a world war ii i think maybe like, because really? so much of it know. was starting over maybe because they were starting anew over here or something but yeah i agree it's you know because i went back originally just trying to you know put together the whole line on my dad's mom's side which i know pretty much all the way through to get a dar registration because i knew he was a, a patriot well crap everybody who was here in the 1700s in my family were all in new england and they were all in the revolutionary war so i keep keep going back and going hey, it must be like at least 12. So like pick the one that's got the easiest route. And it's almost <laughs> like if you're going to do that with the DAR, then you, it really would make sense to register yourself under all of these people to help other people realize how things are cross pollinated. But absolutely. It's it, poor people. Then like you have that. to clean your house and go to the grocery store, you know, so. <laughs> like Mary, like Mary and Deirdre and myself with the immigrants on my dad's side, at least. It's, yeah. it's so freaking not done. It's so, I mean, it's exciting because we're doing something different. We're learning yeah. about history from another country. But I, I mean, seriously, when I went to, when I'm working on my mom's history or the Jerry Andrews history, it, it's like, Oh yeah, ooh, this, 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 ooh, this. they yeah. keep giving the ancestry hits. Next, 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 next. Right, and you right. look at it, you're like, well, that's them, and that's them, and that's yep. them. It's like, yep. in a way, it's kind of like playing a video game or so, or playing like Minesweeper or something. You're just like, or solitary, like click, click, click. <laughs> but in the when we're getting into the immigrants, you're like, yeah, it's almost like no, gathering the information more than looking for it. Yeah. You know what's really interesting? One of the things I learned, somebody said, and it might have been Deirdre. And I, it was just like a light bulb moment. And that's a really nice thing about our small little group is we're sharing these little insights that we have. And Deirdre said, I think it was Deirdre, maybe it was Mary, that, that when they made the, the manifest of who's on the ship, they did it at the port of where they left. And so yeah. people who were there who were writing it probably knew how to spell their names. They probably could speak. The yeah, language. that was I, huge. That was huge for me. I, I didn't realize. I always thought they got to Ellis Island and then they recorded right. it there. And right. I never dawned on me because I guess that's the story they always tell is their name got changed yeah. and they got to Ellis Island or where well, that was always. That's the story of why Petrovich, which is not a last name. Petrovich is a patronym, right? It's a middle name. Really? Yeah, it's son of Peter. So it'd be John, son of Peter, oh. and a last name. So it just links you to your father. But the so the the Petrovichs always say the last name was was lost on Ellis Island. I mean, that was always their story is that you know when they got to they got through the first two names and then they yeah, let them pass through, forget whatever this this weird guy's saying for the third. And that's actually not true. I guess I thought the records at Ellis Island were records for the purpose solely of immigration so they were taking down names as they came in and not that here's a ship's manifest that you always have so you know who's on it and it was just recording the manifest as they came in hmm. so yeah that it's totally different because it, it does that it, like there's a better chance that the names are going to be spelled correctly and they're a better chance that they're going to be that that information is going to be taken down in their native tongue or maybe a tongue that, that they might know because it's a neighboring country right. as opposed to the mosh pit of coming here where who knows yeah i yeah. i don't know i guess like you said i just it's the folklore we've always been told about yeah. ellis island changing it and so that those manifests are probable and it makes sense you know once you think about it it makes total sense because of course you're going to have your um they gotta know who's on the ship. Right, yeah, yeah. 
I don't understand. Now, here's here's something I do have some is, issue with, is I'm reading over like uh, birth records or death records or chip manifests and it's in alphabetical order and it's in that beautiful handwriting so some yeah. one person is doing the writing and you see it for maybe like a year the year of 1850 yeah. and everybody's alphabetic alphabetical now i know those people didn't enter the ship alphabetically no they probably took them down on something else and then somebody created an alphabetical list once it was all and which means there may be problems with transcription or sure because anytime uh, you you do it twice there's yeah yeah so the, i i really hadn't and I they're taking it from somebody Chinese. else's somebody else's handwriting that they're reading yeah and i mean maybe the people filled out their own card or whoever was literate filled out a card and then those cards all went in a bin and then somebody with you know nice handwriting wrote it all out yeah alphabetized it afterwards yeah i'm getting a really weird glitch on my computer screen do you see that whenever i'm talking sometimes it, it goes like these lines of yes course it's not right now while i'm talking yeah, right yeah little yeah, uh, like static on a tv yeah and i don't understand why because i have and it's not happening on my screen no i'm wondering if i have a cord that's about loose or something or i mean i have a brand new computer brand new uh video card drive i have brand new I don't know why it's happening, but anyway, that's funny. Have you seen it before today? Yeah, it happened um, on a couple of the Zoom calls I'm on, which is odd because it still doesn't seem like. Do you think your video cards maybe not push down all the way? I'll blame Caspian because he's the one that put it in. <laughs> no, because it only happens sometimes and it only happens on Zoom. And so I don't know. So it doesn't happen when you're looking at things on the computer? No. Only on Zoom. I don't know. I, I guess I should go and make sure all my plugs are uh, plugged in, but I'm not going to bother. Here, let me see what I've got. I've got some, I have some stuff. It has something to do with the camera if it only is when you're on Zoom. And so it's when you're, it's when you're uh, photographing something, not when you're looking at something. Possibly the cord has gotten loose. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not going to do it right now because I'll be underneath the computer and it would be really funny. Okay. So here's what I got. So let me show you what I got. I got an email and you might have gotten it, received it also from right here. Um, thanks, Mark. For what? For sharing that Thank with you. Kimberly Thank and I. You. Roots You're Tech. Welcome. Roots Tech. So I got this email that's called Four Tips to what is it called? Four Tips to Help Organize Your Photos. And as I go through it, it has all kinds of stuff on here. It's got four videos. I watched one of them. One is restoring your family photos. One is discover your ancestors by exploring historical images. One is unlocking the shoebox, part one of three of digitizing your family photos. So I watched one of them and there's these two experts on there that are talking about, um, you know, uh, how to digitize or what. And and it had a lot to do with not just digitizing it, but to the idea of like what Michaela talked about last was the, um, you know, the, the photos and getting the history from them and finding out what, more information about them. And they, it was really nice because they talked about the, met, the data on the back of the picture, too. They didn't talk oh. about it in depth, but they said you always want to photograph that, too, if there's anything on the back because it connects pictures. So. As I was doing this, I learned about this woman. Her name is, she has a web, uh, a Facebook page, website, all sorts of stuff, even a podcast. But I don't know why you'd want to listen to a podcast about photos because that seems like <laughs> it'd be like a lot of conversation of check out my website. I will have the picture up there. But she's called the photo detective and you can hire her. I don't know how expensive it is, but she has like a $10 off coupon for one photo. So it must be not cheap, yeah. but um, she will take the photo and she will go into great depth to investigate why, who it is, what it is, something like what Michaela was doing. To yeah. some extent. So I thought that was interesting. But what I really thought of what I thought of you is that she had an interview with a man um, who's who is called a postcardist is in expertise is in postcards. And he's been writing postcards since he was six. 
and he still writes them and he still shares them with people. There's a whole world of people out there who are really into postcards and you've got a zillion postcards. Mm-hmm. My sister also is, but there's a podcast that she does and I, I didn't have time to, to listen to it, but I thought it might be interesting. I will put it in the show notes of this episode right now. Let me find it real quick because I have a whole bunch of stuff open. But this is an interview she does with this guy about postcards. And, you know, I suppose if you're interested, you can follow the links and find out more about him. But it it says that, um, you know, I guess as a way of um, looking at your family history in a different way. And as I always say, remember, we're not doing this just for ourselves and our to learn about our history but you yourself are you are your history as well so you know that whole collection you have um i don't know someday you can yeah. get it in order if if anything just alphabetized not alphabetized by year or or something and, and for those who are listening tamberly has a massive collection of postcards she sent home or to yourself when you're traveling in Europe and things, oh, your postcards. I'm talking about things that you created as well. Oh, as yeah, I don't think of those as history, <laughs> but it is, and yeah. it also talks about yeah. not, not only about your you, but there's probably bits and pieces about your family history in there. I think I have all the you. postcards that I sent my grandparents when I went around the world. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, so that's a valuable history that um, it will become important someday so i'm hoping someday you're going to do something with that my sister also has a massive part card collection because i guess my parents did a lot of postcards um as well and she started doing it and so when i grew up and was able to read and write i did postcards and i still do every time i travel somewhere i send postcards to people i send about six or seven postcards to people and i also send a postcard to myself and yeah. so it's so it's dated Thank yeah you. And it has, you know, a little bit of what's going on. And I like the postcard stamps. It's just, it's just yeah. an interesting little bit. It's like a journal. And in one and that of way, the, you actually get them. Yeah, finally, yeah. I get my postcard. So I always send myself and I only take postcards. I really try to take a postcard of something I've seen mm-hmm. or like a map of the area. I like maps a lot, but I don't like to take a postcard of, a building or museum or something that I kn- I didn't get a chance to go to. Right, right. And I like really obscure stuff. So I've got it's not a like, it's not a memory then. Exactly. Right. I don't want to put on there. Gee, I didn't get to go here. I like yeah. go to if you go to uh, um, Hawaii and you're on Oahu and you don't get to go to the to Ar- see the Arizona Memorial. I'm right. certainly not going to send a picture of it. But anyway, so so postcards. Um, was interesting so I I just put that in there another thing that happened is she's got this Facebook page and I I could see that I could get lost in it and this is the woman who's called the photo detective and she puts up all kinds of really interesting articles just scanning through it really quickly and she talks about uh, she puts up history people who found photographs and the history behind it there's one article is, um, that was on the Wall Street Journal. I started to read it, but of course I don't have a subscription to it. I've got subscriptions to a lot of newspapers, but not that one. And it was it looked really good. But the one, and I'm going to share the screen on this one because I thought I pulled up some photos. This was, and I'll sum it up. Darn it! Let's see if I could pull it up without the ads popping up on me. But I mean, I guess I got to sell. They got to sell something oops where do... darn screens all these things pop up in your multiple screens it's like which one so this was um let me move this out of the way this yeah. was a man who in oh gosh where was it look at the Adam. susan b anthony house is actually in north adams if you could believe it oh no seriously <laughs> yeah how do i get rid of this stupid ad everything goes back to north adams in the, and again, back to, as we were saying, yes. there's such a history back there that people are, how do I close this stupid ad that's taking up? Yeah, that's not what I wanted. 
Okay, here it goes. So this man bought, no, here comes the ad again. This man bought a, he was trying to expand his law practice and he bought a building and they had apartments in the building and there was a false ceiling. Oh, never happens in here in our area. I want to go to the East Coast and start exploring. But there was a false ceiling in one of the apartments and he broke into it and he found an old photo studio. Oh, and inside there, he said he got in the, he got into this hole he made. Oh, there it goes. He found all this glittering of, of frames that were in there. And there was a fire in the building next to them. So there was soot all over the, all over everything, but he was still able to see that there was a lot of photo frames in there. And so there's just tons of, uh, he was able to empty it out, but it was an old photo studio that had been uh, closed up. And it was one of the last photos taken of Susan B. Anthony in 1906. And there's a couple oh. other suffragettes in there. Now, I believe these photos exist. So I think the photo studio, I mean, there was other copies made because yeah. they, they used this photo on um, Susan B. Anthony. This is just an original photo that wow. he had developed so in, in the frame and everything. So it's not like this photo has never been seen before, but um, I thought that was really fascinating that um, a lot of these photos were out there yeah. in this, this boxed up thing. Where was it, do you know? Yeah, let's see, it's probably on here. Geneva building. Oh, Geneva, uh, Illinois, maybe? No, was bye. it Illinois? Oh, bye Mark, Mark's got a- Oh, Geneva, New York. Come on. No, it's going up for, oh yeah, but it was taken by Geneva, New York photographer, James Hale in 1905. So he, so I'll put a link to this also in chat. Not that it's a CNN article. Okay, so that was interesting. And then you follow the links and he's got these things up for sale on an auction site. And I thought that was fascinating because the prices are so low and there's just, like twenty five dollars, five dollars, fifteen dollars. Oh, no look bids. at the picture of that little girl. Twenty five bucks, you can get a photo. And I guess the coins are here to show the size of the picture. Yeah. But I find it odd that the coins aren't coins that we would recognize. So I don't know how big that coin is. <laughs> it's a it's a dime. Is that a dime? Yeah. That's not a dime. Yeah. I bet it is a dime. Well, maybe you're right. I don't know. But anyway, so then I pulled up like some you keep selling all the stuff you found. Oh, look at those clothes. Right. So I pulled this up because I thought because of the talk we have with Michaela and they showed those some are fabulous. So we, we could actually sit down probably in practice yeah. trying to decide, you know, the blossoms and the bosoms and the, yeah, and the hair and the, when wow. this photo was taken based on what Michaela had told us. And I think that and the hair, all the things she was saying look at this and then here she is in her camisole i guess that's what it's called and uh, that's really risque photography so this would be like you know woo photography i guess no that's but, the over that's the over that's not the under this goes over uh-huh somebody wore oh that's really tight that's showing her form that's kind of check this woman out wow look i mean if you tried walking around town with something like that on well first you'd boil but the, the idea that you would be able to that was fashionable talk about the hat balancing the shoulders look at that oh, yeah it's like lady gaga kind of style stuff oh wow. and she's so, not that old no but she looks old because she just looks matriarch ma matriarchly Good. but she's Basically. not she's probably in her 30s if not maybe even her 20s but wow. so these are photos that are being sold again it's not like you're gonna buy them because um, I mean, it's just the original print that this yeah. guy made. So that was interesting. And then here's the postcard thing. So those were the things that I this found. This was on Roots Tech? Well, Roots Tech led me to the videos done by this woman called the Photo Detective and another guy who has a website on how to, um, he's like a, he has one of those companies like preserving your history and they'll scan the pictures for you and everything. And it was really kind of disheartening because, you know, I'm doing this archive project, right. And 
you know, thousands of pieces of, of uh, paper. And they were talking about scan it at the highest level possible, like 1200 DPI on TIFF. And I'm thinking that would take forever. forever. And the hard drive space. And I, but I then you can get down into that really small detail if you expand it, right? True, but if I'm looking at a piece of paper, a bill or an invoice or something, yeah. I mean, do I really need to get down to the detail? of? <laughs> so that's, I'm kind of making decisions. I'm scanning some of the photos I'm finding of Jerry Andrews at 600 DPI. And some of them are, I'm saving as TIFFs, but I'm also making them as a 300 because of course you're going to share them. But you know, I'm having these conversations with myself. Am I doing the right thing by not archiving everything at least 600 DPI? Yeah, I just won't seem like I would get through this project. And really, is it possible that anybody's ever going to look at these documents for anything other than just the content on them, the conversations on them? They're not going to blow them up into a poster size or a billboard or something. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm telling myself I'm, I'm doing the right thing by just getting through the project. And everything's going to be preserved. So if somebody really wants to go back and get into this document right. or whatever, right. wants to scan it. Because so, otherwise, they're just going to sit in a box and never be seen by anybody in a storage unit. So, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I feel better. Yeah. So um, this is this is. Um, so I was thinking about it. You can really fall into a hole of uh, if you listen to some people, and these are archivists and things that are archiving their own family photos, but I don't know if they have, I mean, you have a lot, but you really don't have a lot. I mean, you have a lot, but I was able to scan it in a day. Right. You know, right. Together it, for one side of the family it wasn't that much. Right. It, it was doable, but we scanned it all at 300 DPI. Um, I mean, it might've taken three days if we'd done it at a 600 DPI, right. right. but it's still doable. But so I was thinking that, um, you know, if you have a small box of photos, then it makes sense. But he was they were also talking about the idea of taking and getting it done professionally and paying for the best service you can. So if you're if you're going to pay for a service to digitize, then you can you can pay X for 300 DPI or you can pay more for 600 or more for 1200. That's got to be horrendously expensive when you've got a huge collection. Oh, yeah. So I, I was thinking the same thing. And the other thing they were talking about is negatives are much more important. Really scan a negative. And you could take the negatives and go down to a um, photo place. And they you could have them make, uh, put it on like a DVD and then take it from there. That's going to be the best quality image you can. Of course, it's going to be expensive, but... You could do that yes. if keeping you have rare the, photos. Keeping it in the negative is the best way to keep yes. it. He says Why? the negative is actually the best place to keep it. So again, I was thinking if you have a handful or you know 20 or 30 slides that you really think are really quality that you want to do that for, okay, I could see doing that. But then again, my brain says to my, me, who's going to really going to blow it up that big? And then the other thing I'm thinking is the photo isn't that great. Because it was, um, you know, I guess if it's a professional portrait studio, like taken with a high, you know, resolution camera, I don't know how, in the 1800s, whatever, but they're not necessarily the best quality photo anyway. Mm -hmm. You're not, you know, digitizing photos at the highest quality possible of a with, photo that's taken yeah. with, you know, an Instamatic. Yeah, it's not is gonna that make really. It yeah, if it's a historical photo, yeah, of of something important, in, you're not going to improve the quality of the original. Exactly, you're yeah. just going to yeah. And if you're if you're looking at the for the data of something that's in a photo, well, okay, that's nice. But are you really going to be looking into the quality the, I mean the the people in the background? Are you really gonna, planning on looking at the photo of the people in the crowd? Maybe. Maybe not, but I mean that's like crime scene forensics, maybe. Yeah, that yeah, definitely. I would have that at the highest resolution so you could look for a license plate number or something yeah. or doorbell doors, the background of the door. Um 
to get information around it. Yeah, I mean, all really, that makes really sense. Wonderful. But but that's only going to be as good as what the original was. Exactly. Yeah. So so I, you know, I'm having like I said, I'm having these conversations. I feel a little guilt because I'm trying to do this com- this thing, and I'm trying to get through it. I'm at 1975. I just finished a couple of days ago, and it's. I mean, I know I'm only going to 2007, but it is intense and it's paper and paper and paper and paper and paper lots of paper hardly any photographs but um you know I, i'm telling myself like you said it, it's it, it's as good as it needs to be i think and you know i've got a whole bunch of pictures he took or was taken of him in japan and he did a he was with a bunch of magicians there and they're just like taken on a well 1974 1975 camera and yes. and they're printed and it's got that like a bumpy texture to it oh, a little yeah. bit yeah. so when you scan it it's kind of still got a, a little you can't get in too close right because the, the light reflects off the bumps yeah, yeah so it's 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 only as good as it's going to be so i you know there are these these people in the world who are experts of these things that just feel like we got to get into the you know archival everything on it and i'm thinking you know for most people just copy the damn thing just make it just get it get it done otherwise it's going to be insurmountable tasks they're never going to do it they're going to say to themselves i i just can't it's not museum preservation Right. right exactly and i think that if there are some old ones that yes okay and then also in the video that I watched, they were talking about um, tin types and some of the older things yeah, and how you might not want to put them in the like scanner. It. Yeah. He, they, they showed a light box, a portable light box you could make. And then you put the, the image in there and then you put a camera on top or even your cell phone is close. Yeah. Enough. And then you put the light on and then you can take a but picture. So fragile. Yeah. And then another really interesting thing that I've heard this before, and I think I've said this too, is like with, with what Mary has, she has a photo album. She got to take that thing apart, but before she should take it apart, she should photograph the paper, yeah. the, the whole thing. That's going to be kind of hard considering she's got huge pages. I mean, that book's like a yeah, like okay, 18 by 18 or, or yeah, 24 by 24. It looked pretty big. It was, it was massive. So she's yeah. not going to be able to do that easily. She's going to have to find like a nice gray day. That's what I use is a yeah. overcast day, put it in a spot, make sure there's no clear on anything and do your darndest, put maybe your camera on a tripod and yeah. take a picture of the whole page. And that was another tip that they explained. And I, like I said, I've said that before It's because you want to keep it in the historical. You also want to take a picture of each individual photo close up. Right. But you take a picture of writing on the pages too. That yeah, writing. underneath. Yeah. And and the context of how the page was created is important to knowing um how what was important. Is that you? Yeah. Oh, that's weird. That was creepy. So it's two o'clock. So yeah. Cindy should be along here really shortly. She wanted what? Oh, your clock. Yeah. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. I have a cat in here, I think at my feet. I still haven't eaten my cheese stick. Um, so what else do we have? Mm. The entire class today of you and I. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what. So Mary, we were hoping would be here. I don't know what happened to her. I thought she was gonna be. She's probably getting washed away with rain. Yeah, because I'm really curious about what happened. That's that's partly what why uh, Cindy told me record because she really wants to hear what happened what Mary found but maybe there's not enough in there to have found anything um um she has um that's a huge task I hope I mean I know just doing photos it's exciting but yeah and if you don't have a place to do it where you can lay it all out and leave, and leave it, it. not worry about a dog or a cat yeah. getting up on it in the night. <laughs> yeah. And you can come back to it and go go through it again and and look at it and look at it and look at it and take your time. I mean it's like doing a jigsaw puzzle, as you well know. You have jigsaw puzzles too, but you can't do it overnight and put it away at the end of the night and then right. think that it's gonna be, 
you know, you might not come back to it for a week. So I hope, I hope Mary's um, um, able to do it. Boy, it is exciting what she found. Yeah. Yeah. And to just, I mean, to have stuff labeled and pictures of people that she didn't know of and that sort of thing. All right. Do you remember if a lot of those were from America or were those pictures taken in um, overseas? I got the sense that they were all they were all domestic. Well, her family hasn't been here that long. Yeah, but it didn't go back. It didn't go back into the like mid eighteen hundreds or anything, did it? I thought they were more. I don't think we know. I thought in some of the the pages she knew who some of the people were. It was like a there was a great aunt that she had known. Yeah, but then it was as a young child. Eighteen twenty nineteen twenties. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I, or maybe it was Michaela was talking about some photo of some women holding beer. Well, or no, she was talking about that. Wasn't oh, that, no, that those were Mary's? yeah, those were Mary's because she knew that they were taken in Vienna. The the gals of the beer and Mary said yeah. Yeah, that was taken in Vienna. So yeah, they were. Was her family in Vienna? I don't remember any mention of her being yeah. in Vienna. Yep, she said it was in Vienna and her uh which of her family members was from Vienna? Like like any people well, up? That whole Austro-Hungarian, right? I, I think she said that, that her grandmother had lived or was from Vienna. Grandmother or great-grandmother, probably. Wait, is this the grandmother that had the sheep? Or was that Deirdre's family? I'm getting confused. The sheep would have been... That was Deirdre's family, wasn't it? That the grandmother was sent away at like age nine to ten. No, to no, that was that was Joe's grandparents. Oh, am I that confused? Yeah. No. We've never talked about Joe's family. Yeah, the 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 one that was uh, Polish, not Lithuanian, was the the goose herder, and she from a young age had left her family and was working for another family herding goose, geese. No? Well, I mean, I remember, is this the same one that she was sent away? She's living out in, like in the field with the, with the, with the, I thought it was she. Uh, geese. And then she's there for a long time and then she gets married to somebody. Yeah, met met his great grandfather or met his grandfather in England. They had their first five kids there and then moved here. And this is Joe's family? His mom's mom. Yeah, his mom's mom. Wait alone us. Are you sure that Dirty didn't have some similar story of a grandmother who is I thought she's no, oh, why do I think you're German? Well, if it was sheep or cows, that would be that would be um, dairy probably. But no, the, that shot with the four girls that were mm -hmm. and the two had kind of like the bolo ties on. And she, was, they're wearing some kind of uniform or yeah, like she was costume. In, it was in Vienna. Yeah, I don't remember her family being from Vienna. Boy, am I really confused. I've got yeah, so many Vienna. stories in my head of all these different. <laughs> well, but also, <laughs> I don't know where from. You know, Vienna and the Ukraine, not that far apart. Austria, that whole Austro Hungarian. I mean, Vienna is, is east look now. of Vienna is east of Prague. You're so much more world, world traveled than <laughs> I'm no, lost already. Know because if you refer to uh -huh. Africa, yeah, Eastern said. Europeans, they they say they are Central Europeans. That the Austrians are Eastern. But yeah, I think I thought she said it was Vienna that her grandmother, which makes sense if you look at a world map, right? Yeah, that's what I'm doing right now because I am lost completely. I mean, I know where Austria is. I know where Ukraine is. You oh, Austria! Look at see, you know, yeah. And look at look at the Ukraine and um, Ukraine and Austria touch. No, no, they don't. 
Ukraine touches Slovakia, Hungary, oh, Slovakia. Romania, okay, Poland, Moldo Moldovia. Moldovia. But that's all around like Czech Republic. That's so he knows I have a piece of cheese here. Here, have some cheese, kitty. You're being such a good boy. Yeah, you're a good boy. Um, Vienna. Slovakia, Hungary. But look where Vienna is right up against Slovakia. Because it's east of Prague and not that far from the Slovak border. Yeah, it and, is. Because down the river from Vienna is Bratislava and then Budapest. Mm -hmm. So Ukraine's over there. Look it! So that's that it. Easier. But it's where's it. everybody else? <laughs> we've, been, we've been going on as if they were all here. Well, Kimberly reminded me that Deirdre's in, in Tahoe. Oh, that's right. Yes, I don't I know did. what happened to Mary. I have Hamilton. I brought my, I brought an extra. Hmm. He's here. <laughs> he knows I have cheese. Susan plus one. Okay, well then I'm going to eat my lunch because, it, you know, it's just you guys. So. Hey, Cindy. <laughs> hey, Cindy, I'm hey, recording. You should close, eat with your mouth closed. <laughs> how did the procedure, <laughs> okay. did the procedure go last week? I'm sorry, say it again. How did your procedure go last week? Oh, okay. So Remember, do you want me to pause it so you don't have to hear it on video? Okay, Wait, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> just... I'll leave it running because I'll forget to turn it back on again. It okay. so interesting. All thousands of people are watching this right now. I know. True. No, so the, the procedure slash surgery, I mean, I don't know what's a procedure and what's a surgery. I was in a surgery center. I was under mild sedation. They put a stitch okay. in my eye. I mean, you know, so what is it a surgery? So anyway, so um, yeah, I mean, it, it seemed to go well. He cleaned things out. He got rid of the blood clot. Um, I was already beginning to see smudges of color. Did and, it relieve some of the pressure? Well, that's the, the, the thing. So the next day when I saw him post-op, it was... The pressure was 26, which is better than it was, but not good enough. 26 is still too high. It needs to be under 20. Oh. And, you know, 26 once in a while, you know, okay, check it again. But this has now been over 20 for weeks, you know, and that's getting potentially serious. But, you know, we were all feeling pretty good about 26, see you in a week. And, um, and, and, and I was beginning to see more and more, depending on the light, not real shapes, but color splotches yeah. and, you know, and I, and I know what I'm looking at. So if I didn't know what I was looking yeah. at, I'm not sure if I could identify it. But anyway, Monday I was due to see one of the other doctors and, um, he took my pressure and it was 39, hmm. which it was up too high again. So um, I said to Dr. Chen, the doctor I was seeing, well, maybe I should see about seeing Dr. Richardson, the glaucoma guy, earlier than Thursday. And he said, Dr. Richardson was there. He would go ask him, which I think is a phenomenon. I mean, he got up from the examination room and yeah. walked down the hall. Oh. And found the doctor and they talked it over and decided I should come in on Tuesday. So I went back and saw Dr. Richardson on Tuesday and it was still somewhere in the 30s. He couldn't get an exact reading. So um, that's kind of it. Um, and I, I just, they, they've done medically um, almost everything they could. Yeah, Pat's here too. Is it time for, oh, it's time for drops. The drop man has arrived. Hold on. Okay. Give me a second. Okay. Yeah, I'm making up for lost time because I missed a couple of drops while I was done. Cindy, we did record a whole good hour of all sorts of fascinating stuff you're going to have <laughs> to listen to. We said, 
Is this me and Kimberly? Who's Raccoon, this? Who's this dog? Cats, yeah. <laughs> You'll feel right <laughs> like you were right here with us. <laughs> okay. Right, go ahead. Anyway, so um, they, they are doing medically everything they can. I mean, there's nothing further. They, I'm, I'm having six different drops. Um, this pill that's taking fluid out, um, you know, everything, they, they can't do anything else but put a shunt in. Yeah. So, oh, hello. There's a person in my. There's a person. On the bottom of my screen. How could there be a person on the bottom of your screen? Hello, person at the bottom of my screen. Who are you? Your Zoom screen? Yeah, like a another whole Zoom. Sub Zoom. A sub Zoom. Oh, cool. It might be in the Matrix. <laughs> Who are you guys? No, oh, there's nobody here but us chickens and my cat. But they're not moving. It's like a picture. Hold on. I'm going to. How do I make you guys diminish? Here, I'm going to diminish you for a minute. Oh, I feel diminished. Join the conversation, social media, on how. No, I am not interested in you at all. <laughs> How do I get rid of you? Is it a Nigerian prince? Huh? Is it a Nigerian prince? Yeah, I don't know what it is. I don't know. As Pat. There, there's no exit. There's no. So like an ad has popped up? Cut. No, it's like. Join the conversation. Follow our blog and social media channels for products, tips, how-to guides, company updates, and more. Is this within the black of your Zoom box? No, it's like it was below the Zoom box. I put so make it a full screen. We're, it's just a, it's just something that's come up underneath yeah. you. Yeah. Or just ignore them. It sounds like it's like when you get a pop up for an email. But I can't get message. rid of it. There's no button to get rid of it that I can see. Well, make us bigger. It should block them. You know, should cover it up. And then when you close Zoom, it'll probably be self-evident. Yeah, I just don't like it being on there at all. But it's a and when I'm going to go out altogether and come back in. Okay. Okay, so let me see here. Well, so I pull you guys back up. How do I do that? Oh, I hate this not seen. All right. Okay. All right. You guys are back. I'm going to leave. Okay, Hamilton, don't leave. leave. Hamilton, stay right there. You know, it's so funny. I'm sitting here looking at this map of Europe and you pet the cat. I'm always surprised. I'm always surprised at how much bigger France is than the UK. Well, it's big, so maybe it's not. And how, and how close, I always forget how close the UK and the Netherlands are. And you just think of World War II and them getting cut off from everything and bombarded, it's just crazy. I'd be a horrible weather person. Yeah, I, I'm just like I, I would have to have like hours of training, and then the weather, yeah, the I know. Are coming in on the side, and the little I can't even say it. Rain. Pet the cat. Pet the cat. Put the hat on the statue. Pet the cat. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, surgery is the next step where they're going to put a shunt in. Yeah. And what happened today? Is the shunt, Cindy, the one where they take the flap and sew the flap back so it stays open? This is where they stick a tube in. Oh. Is there gonna stick a tube in? My dad's was a like a like a V that they cut yeah. and, then, and then then stitched it back so it stayed open. Yeah, they talked about something like that, but I think they thought it would just close back up with blood and gunk and yeah. But this is a tube. And they're, they're, this is the biggest tube, I think, wide opening, um, so that it can get rid of the most crud. And even that, it, it may fill up and have to be done again. Yeah. I mean, 
we may not be out of the woods altogether. Um, and there's something he said about a month or two that neither Pat nor I got. We'll have to question him again about, and I, it may be that we'll see what happens in a month or two in terms of whether it fills up blood, you know, blocks again. But I mean, you know, we have to do it because the, this will cause damage to the eye, yeah. the pressure, if it hasn't already done some. So, um, so you went today for your post-operative, right? Pre-op. 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 So that, that's basically, they take my blood pressure, they take my temperature, they say, you know, wear a button thing because it's hard to do a pullover over a patch. I mean, I have a surgery shirt. I have a shirt that is designated by surgery <laughs> <laughs> because it buttons and most of mine are, you know, t-shirts, um, you know, just it's stuff I know inside and out, and, but we go over it. They did change the time slightly because there was a cancellation, you know, and they may change again, who knows, but it, the surgeries at 1230, I have to be there at is that tomorrow. Monday, I have to be there at 10.30, Monday. Uh, and I'll be under mild sedation. So I should recover pretty easily. And you guys went, are you still there? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. And, um, and that's that. And then I go back the next day for a post-op. And then two weeks after that for post-op, um but my guess is he'll he'll want to see me you know the day after surgery and then my guess is he'll want to see me a couple of days after that so in the meantime I still don't see well enough to give myself my own drops so that's just how it is hmm oh you know it's getting a little frustrating it's getting more than a little frustrating. I, when I left yesterday, knowing I was going to have this, you know, had to have, or I guess left Tuesday, I had, I had my cane because I, I take my cane, but I really wanted to take that cane and hit something. Yeah, maybe you <laughs> should. We should set up a hidden area. Pat's tough. <laughs> yeah, Pat's I, big. He can handle it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It's, well, you can come over and tomorrow I'm going to be uh -huh. in the garage. I've got all kinds of things you can beat up on if you want. Oh, my cat. Hamilton, stop that. You're on film. Well, my sister-in-law is getting knee replacement next Tuesday. Yeah. So she had to go in for, you know, her blood works and her tests. And she said, who in a pandemic world, when you <laughs> go nowhere, gets MERS. And she ended up having MRSA. So she has to put this ointment What's up her nose for five days before surgery. She said, What's MRSA? It's that, uh, oh, they always check you before you go into the hospital because it's a, it's a staph infection that they have a hard time controlling in hospitals. Yeah, but I've never heard of that. A, a, asymptomatic with MRSA. She goes, where the hell do you get that when you haven't <laughs> been anywhere for a year and a half? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, you know, they're going to be removing part of my wall in the garage. So I've got a sledgehammer. I've got, I've got some claw hammers. If you guys uh -huh. come over and get out your aggression on whatever, you're more okay. than welcome to come and take a bunch of swings at my wall. <laughs> Very good. You know, when I, <laughs> when I got ready to rip the, the um, walls out in my second bedroom, my girl mm -hmm. in Austin was was visiting and she had just broken up after a 25 year oh. relationship. Mm -hmm. Was it hard mm -hmm. at all to convince her to come down and do demo work <laughs> through those walls? Well, you know what else I have? Off. Once we once we put everything back in the storage, I've got a ton of bubble wrap. I can bring it over and you guys can, you know, Cindy, if you want to sit and pop bubble wrap, that'll that'll help stress. I might be a little safer than getting um. <laughs> We'll put those huge goggles on you. Put you. I have a motorcycle. No, I don't have it anymore. Yeah, I wonder if you could use bubble wrap as insulation. Enough layers of bubble wrap should insulate, right? I don't it's know. Encapsulated pockets of air. Hmm. Possibly. I just think it's better for tension. Yeah. 
I was telling Tamberly that our conversation is so interesting. I could see that we're going to have our own Netflix show. Yeah. <laughs> Just ramblings, Catalina ramblings. Oh, that's a real that's housewives a really of good Catalina name. Exactly. Yeah. That's a California. really good name. Real, real housewives. I don't want to be a housewife. <laughs> the you know, real housewives of Catalina. The real, the real women of Catalina Avenue. Real women. Well, and now I'm curious about that car that Elba said, because I've seen that car several times and I saw it this morning well, when I was working out this. because it's just sitting there with its lights on. Where's the lights lights on? It's a, it's a silver car that um, different periods of time in day and night has been parking kind of on that side of the street for either a short period of time that or a side, long period of time. Which is which side? Uh, your side. Our, my side. Yeah. Never Where getting out, just pulling over and parking and sitting there. So Where? she's out a text to, you know, just put people on the alert. It's a Mercedes. I don't think so. I'm looking at the uh, picture she said. Like an Acura or something. Well, it's got a round and it's got like a, huh. Well, you parking know. By Elba's, street, by Elba's house. It was kind of in front of uh, the Lindy's. Hmm. Well, you know what? It could be just as simple as this person wants to sit in a tree lined area where it's quiet and they are doing paperwork or they're doing eating their lunch yeah. or. Yeah, but it's also at night. Oh. I, that, um, that's Is it one of the psychics finally coming to get me? <laughs> they're waiting for me to go for a walk and they're going to run me over? That's more like something like a. It's a private investigator watching me. or something. Maybe it's me they want to do. They don't know that I have Gladys Kravitz's all over the... All or, over it's the a, or it's somebody casing the block, you know. But Who knows? why? Hmm. I saw him in front of Elba's this morning because when I, I was halfway through working, I went to open up the window. And so it's like somewhere between probably around 730. And I'm used to the neighbor kids' cars across the street, but this was right in front of Elba's house that it parked. But that's weird. I wonder what that silver car is parked right in front of Elba's. And then the headlights were on for a long time. I thought, well, that's really weird. What's that silver car doing parking in front of Elba's? Well, they. But it must have taken off when she came and took the picture of it. <laughs> Why doesn't anybody get a picture of what the person looks like? Well, I think her first one is she she must have crossed the street to get that picture. So she probably walked across the street and took a photo, which I would have Elba's, done. But Elba's the type that would just go right after, hey, yeah. what are you doing? I'd go out there and take a photo of the license plate. And that usually scares people off. Oh, I, yeah. I always think of the best of people. They might not be back. I'm always the type that's like, I'm sure there's an ex explanation that makes total sense and I don't know what, and, what was it two weeks ago when that gal had the guy bust through the back door while she's sitting in her house <laughs> in Pacific Park. That was scary. 8.30 in the morning. What happened? I guess it looked like nobody was home because she had seen this car that she thought was kind of slowly going past a couple times that morning. And she was working in her home mm -hmm. about 8.30 and she hears and she she's like, Susan, she has the the you know, the camera thing on her, on that she can get to her phone and a guy uh, kicked in the back door of the house. So she was in the front part of the house? Yeah, she was at work on her computer and came in the back of the house and started going around and she saw it on the, um, on her computer and called 911 and then screamed at the guy and he went out and he came back in again and then went out and left. But kicked in her back door at 8.30 in the morning in Pacific Park. Hey, Tamberly, I can hear you fine, but you don't seem to be moving. <laughs> Wait, right now you're sitting with your hand in front of your face. Oh no, it's your, it's frozen because I'm moving. Susan can She's see me. She's moving. moving. She's a moving. <laughs> Do the Ginga stuff. But I can Not hear like her. But Susan is moving. I'm doing Ginga style. So Susan, I, Ginga style. And Susan, you can see me move. Yeah, of course. Huh. I'm telling you, this is riveting video. 
Now, Susan, I haven't seen the that. Oh nope, never. I just did it. I was going to say I hadn't seen that distortion on the on the screen. Yeah, I think I, I think it's just some glitch that because I move my monitor when I'm doing a lot of scanning, and I'm I'll, I'll move my monitor really close yeah. up to me to type and stuff to do, deal with it. So, and I'm I might maybe have just loosened something somewhere. Mm -hmm. Hey, don't go nowhere. You you're you're in part of the group now. We have four people here. This is why you're here. <laughs> right. You could tribute if you want. Thing. What do you got to say, Ham? More cheese. He says more cheese. So, Tamberly, I wrote um email with your daughter when she was wonderful to respond back. Oh, you emailed her? I did because do you remember we were talking about that one picture of Mary Murray McCluskey Burke and her husband William Burke. And they looked, they were sitting what we thought was their marriage party. Yeah. And, uh, but Michaela said she thought it was in the 80s, but they got married in seven, 1876. And so it got me to think because she was, she had jet on her outfit. Right. And I couldn't think of anybody offhand that would have died except for her first husband like two years before. Oh, there was the one with the woman. She was sizable standing yeah. beside a man yeah. and she yeah. was in all black. Yeah. Yeah. So I started thinking about it and that's what I wrote to Michaela in parentheses. Isn't that what a good teacher is supposed to make you do or something like that? Yeah. And um, her, I thought about her parents, who were still in Scotland, died in 1879 and 1881. Oh. So that, you know, could fit in there. Could she be wearing her, would they have worn mourning for a family member they probably hadn't seen? In... Yeah, I don't know. And I don't know what the so, custom was. She said, so she looked at, Michaela looked at William's outfit more. She said she might do that. And so she did. And apparently it's not really conclusive. Um, but the one thing is that his hair, his facial hair, is around 1980, but that's a real preference yeah. thing. And um, so, you know, it really wasn't conclusive. So I told her, okay, I would leave it, because right now it's labeled 1876-1880. So I told her I'd put a question mark next to that and then say, you know, perhaps wedding photograph question mark, which is fine. But um, it was really, really interesting for her to write me back. And I went through and I wrote down all the, you know, when she was born, when he was born, their age at wedding. And she was 38. No, he had just, he was barely, almost 38. She was 39. They see that picture? Photo? Jabberly <laughs> are both are going. I know. Oh, I look like she's in her late fifties. I know, and so you know. But Michaela pointed out people seem to age quicker in that time period. Um. Well, I don't know. <laughs> and the other thing is, I found a picture. I, I thought I had one, and it took me a while to find it. Of Mary in um in somewhere between 1910 and, and her death in 1916. And she's in, um, Michaela said the little she could see in the sleeve, but she thought it was more 1990 fashion. 1890. But, 1890, sorry. And that, but then, you know, maybe she's just an older lady. She doesn't care kind of thing. Um, but her hairstyle is identical. It was, I don't know if you remember, it was a severe pulled back hairstyle. Huh. And it was exactly the same. Um, whatever that was, 20 or 30 years later. Maybe she was one of those people that had one hairstyle her whole life and never changed it. I, that's what I you said. Know? It's her, her look and she stuck to it. So, I, you know, but it, I, I just, the whole process made me stop and think and analyze. And the fact that they were so young and, and that just, you know, so she, yeah, that's, she had a, a child in 78, so she would have been 41 or something, which is perfectly reasonable for her. This would have been her 
fifth or sixth child. I mean, that, yeah. that's an okay age for that. So she, was, she had children that were, know. so none of the children had died, right? Pardon me? None of the that's, children had died. One of them was the, the little girl who got raped. That was in her child. That was one of her children. And what year so, was that? Wasn't that like 1913 or 1920? No, 18, 18. So they arrived in America in 1872. And then Pat's father was born here in 1872 or 1873. And then the daughter was killed in 1873. And Papa was killed in the mining accident in 1874. And then two years later, Mary married William Burke. So, so the baby was, a, was killed and the little girl was killed in 73, I think. 1873. Yeah. Yeah. So, but she had, Mary had John, Mary, William, James, Patrick, Joseph. Yeah, she had six children with James McCluskey and then one more with William Burke. So the one more when she was 40 something was in, um, was her seventh. And what time, what, what year was the last, the one with this guy born? 1878. So, you know, I guess I could kind of understand her being older because she went through a lot. And there's yeah. no chance that she's pregnant in this photo where she's rather thick waisted. Well, she, well, she was, yeah. she's 37, I guess it's possible. Oh, sure. No, so no, she was in that. When she got married, she was 39. Um, and so she's only she married to him at this point. And so there was like, let's see, I looked this all up. Wait a minute, I've got it here. Do you have it, do you have it open, Tamerly? No, I've yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the picture of-, of Screen share um, it again. Oh, good, okay. She's got it open. Oh, good. So she, let's see. Yeah, she was 39 when she got married. Yeah. And Tommy Burke was born about a year later, a year and a couple of months later. So he was born like January of 1878. And they got married in December of 76. So Can soon it was 77 yeah, and the kid yeah. was born. Blue so it up bigger. Was, I want to look at that. That uh, what did you guys call it again? The black stuff, the jet. Oh, jet! It's a stone. Yeah, we and it's beads. used a lot for um, mourning. What do you think that white thing is? Is on I'm her? Yeah, that. What do you think that is? The cuff. Maybe a pearl or something. Can oh. you pull it up? Um. Did they still have the same customs as we have, like something borrowed, something blue, something? Mm, I don't know. Because that would be interesting if she's wearing something that was borrowed or, a, you know, if, if that would be, I don't know, like on other people's outfits, you would see it because it doesn't really fit. It's not like it's a. I'm just looking at, at her figure. I know she's got a corset on. Right. But um, she could be semi wise. It's like. Well, She's really. So she could be, it could be, I mean, that's what Michaela said. Thick and low. After their wedding. Yeah. Which but they never be. got a chance to take their wedding picture and maybe this is the. Yeah. But that's odd. Why would she do it in the morning? Well, that's the thing. Unless like, that's yeah. her best dress. Which yeah. is like. Well, exactly. Unless she's, she's in that morning period and you're going to wear that regardless of whether or not you're getting your photo taken. And if it's her parents, if it's, you know, 79 or 81, when one of her parents has died, let me see if I can find the, Just you know what? Wise, this looks like one of those shapes where everything down here is loose and floppy. <laughs> That's right. my style right now. <laughs> she's pinched in and then it, then it. I just, have a Zoom body. Everything's great up goes, here. <laughs> it's like. Right. 
an incredible pair. So do you think, okay, here's a question. Is yeah. it a portrait studio or is it a pop-up photographer that took the picture? Or it's a studio. It's a studio because of, the, because of the plain background. Where are you going to find a big plain wall like that? Well, if they were traveling, well, they usually put a well, background. Yes, that there's another yeah, thing. Yeah. He was really active in the um, Grand Armory of the Republic. GAR and they went to conventions and it's possible this was like one of those and it was a you know get your photo taken thing yeah that's true well see the reason why I'm asking is because if she could have gone to a studio in town pretty much at any time then she might have waited until she was out of mourning but if it was a pop-up kind of thing where it's like hey we're gonna get your picture taken where your best yeah, this rest. looks like a backdrop yeah. yeah, it does. But a lot of the backdrops, they usually weren't solid color like that. They were mostly painted like curtain looking oh, like a room. Yeah. So it's unusual. That is unusual right there. Not that I'm an expert on it, but I have not seen a lot of studio. Well, studio photos might be a, a plain background, but a person who's coming through town to do photos for a day or two usually used a background that was painted yeah hmm. so i want to see if i can find that picture again of her you know 40 years now that i look at her she really isn't that old no uh -uh. Uh -uh. and that it hairstyle is isn't that much of a hairstyle it's a woman keeping her hair at her face not like a well a you know what? Yeah, let me see if i and these sleeves, I, these sleeves are those kind that are, uh, they aren't straight, they're bent sleeves. So even if her arm were straight, it still would have this going out. Hmm. Hmm. Hey, is she wearing a wedding ring? Yes. yes. I think so. That, that, yeah. that looks like a wedding ring. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michaela noticed that too. So she's, it's after her wedding. So let, how, how can I uh, physically, go to look for her um, other picture, the other picture. I need is it to in this, is this in here? No, it's not in there. I no. mean, it wasn't in the presentation that- No, because I didn't find it, but okay. I found it now. Oh, so what are you asking, Can how to share it? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, but first I have to, well, see if I can find it. Okay, so I hit share. Yes. Okay, you guys are gonna to have to help me on. Share a screen, it's a, it's a bright lime colored green. Yeah, there it is, okay. All right, and then let me find my, where's my magnifier? Should be on your left-hand side, I thought. There it is. Oh. So, you know, I'm sort of frazzled and, um, okay, it's in File Explorer. And let's see if I can go there, go here, okay. I may not be able to find it again because it was buried within something. Do, do, do. No, that's not it. Stanford, McCluskey. Da, 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 Stanford, McCluskey. Do you remember what it was called? Because you could search for it. No, I don't. Well, it would have been Mary Murray, probably. Let me see if I could maybe find it. It was one of those buried within a buried kind of thing. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. This is where Susan's uh, method of being absolutely consistent on. Yeah, I, know. I, I'm, I was watching before we started the show today, I was watching um, a couple of videos on, on tagging and putting things in metadata. And I was watching a man who has thousands, like 15,000, 20,000 photos that he, he's a professional photographer and he takes them of an event. And he says, you know, how am I going to search through 15,000 photos of an event I went to? And I'm thinking, well, you shouldn't be taking that many pictures first off, to be honest with you. But the point is he, he was showing how he used to program and, and he puts keywords in there and, there and he's got this huge, like maybe 
30 names of keyword in the keywords in the metadata. And some of them were just like jumping, uh, bike riding, uh, the state, Kansas, you know, it's just like really, really detailed stuff. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a pain. Oh, we lost Cindy. But some, but I guess for a professional photographer who's hoping to sell his work places, people yeah. are looking for advertisements. Like if you're putting on a we lost Cindy. Yeah, she'll be right back. She must have hit. Um, so it's not, he wasn't doing facial recognition. No, he was he was doing like, I guess if a magazine wants to buy a picture of a, a bike rider that's in the BMX bike rider in the sunset in Washington. In, oh, he was like doing keyword metadata. Yeah, so I was watching oh. that. And there was a program he was recommending that you can get. And um it's like google pulls up all these things and you can just copy and paste or kind of thing and and it it, it looked really cool but i'm thinking i am not going to go to that kind of detail of a uh, of a photo that just got i'm not selling anything yeah so, and i certainly don't have 20 or thirty thousand photos but it's like a a, a massive way of cross-referencing right right for sell so you can yeah. sell it and he also said that he had pre, like he's got a copyright thing on his. So he has a, um, like he's got some things that are saved, some sort of keyword thing that's saved so that he can click on it and it will add the copyright to the metadata also. And I guess he could do the same thing where, uh, like if he's shooting a certain event, he would put all the keywords in that event and then he would save it and then you would just click on some link in some kind of program he has, and then it would just take it and put it onto the metadata. So you don't have to sit there and write everything. Every oh. time. You're just constantly copying and pasting and, or maybe the program does it automatically. Like it pre-tagged all the photos as he took every, it. Yeah, and, and then you would just change it as, like if it's a certain bicyclist, you would just change it, take somebody's name in or put it out, you know, depending on who's in the photo. Um, he was saying work smarter, not harder. Oh, <laughs> and I thought, oh, that does make sense. Cause it, I haven't tagged all mine. I've started to, I mean, everything is tagged as I'm putting yeah, it in, but as I'm the time on the front end to do it. Yeah. Right. But as I'm going through and I'm starting to read the letters and understand the context of what's happening in the letters that I'm reading or the invoices, I can see that sometimes people who are not mentioned in the letter actually should probably be tagged because it is pertinent to whatever is happening in, yeah. in their world. And I'll also see, or maybe sometimes a person is tagged, Some sometimes a person has mentioned the article, but it's, or the letter, like one time. And I think, well, should I put their name in there or not? And right. You have to understand the context of the- Because it might be really important. Yeah. And again, as I was saying, some of these things, I'm doing, you know, as I'm doing it, I don't know if necessarily it's. That's so weird on something that you don't have a, an attachment to. Right. So I'm, yeah. oh my gosh, I had no idea there was so much drama in the magic world, but I'm <laughs> every couple of years there's drama. And so there's writing yeah. letters back and forth because of course they're not have anything else to do. So they're writing letter. I mean, they can't send emails. So they're writing letters back and forth. Do you remember what happened in this circumstance and this is my side of the story and then somebody mm -hmm. comes in and their side of the story and and jerry kept everything so i've got both sides and uh like he was at one conference and he said he was supposed to be picking somebody up and he 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 didn't get a lot of sleep because some person came to the conference who hadn't heard jerry's side of the story so they spent like till six in the morning talking about the side of the story whatever happened and he was catching this friend up and i thought well, I guess that's related to the drama. Yeah. So it's not exactly related to the drama, but that's so weird. It, it is. So I, I've made this, I'm doing my best to tag it like I showed you I was doing with the keywords and stuff. But I know I'm going to have to go back through maybe two or three times just to read it in context. Because it'll be on my computer. Understand it. The more you touch it, the more you find, you understand it more. And then I'll be able to yeah. tag it more. So here's my show and tell. From earlier oh is that beautiful that's a baby blanket uh-huh oh my goodness this is going to justin's little baby girl uh-huh oh isn't that beautiful in october 
Wow, that's coming up. You know, I found a ton and I, I meant to tell you this too. So working in the portrait studio business as I did for years, I kept all the backgrounds that I could possibly when we closed. So I got fabric, large pieces of fabric. And so I have, oh, wow. my, I have my friend come over who's also doing baby photos and she took a bunch of stuff, but I was left with a lot of odd uh, fabric. It's not necessarily, it's thicker and stuff. And I thought yeah. I'm not getting rid of this because it may be useful sometime. And yeah. I don't think I'm ever going to do photography again. Not, not baby photography. Unless I get a baby, yeah. I don't think I'm going to do much. And if I do, it's going to be situational where I'm using blankets, like the one you just yeah. put up, something that's personal. I don't need a studio anymore. But so I was thinking I'm, I'm going to hang on to that. And maybe you're going to need something too, possibly as yeah. a back for a it's like backdrop or something. Yeah, it would be an interesting quilt, the back of a quilt. Especially if you stitched around. Is it, the, usually, is it like a molted color usually? I have all kinds. Oh. I, have, I have flat fabric. I have this black fabric for a black background that was probably the size of a wall that you have in your, well, it was bigger than oh. the wall that you have in your house because it, it, we have to stretch it all the way out so we could photograph 30 or 40 people. And so I've got this, it's wool. it's wool. It's like a thick wool and I have it in black. And I thought, what am I going to do with this? And I said, I'm putting it in box and, you, and putting it back. You were allowed to just take that stuff? Well, they had no choice. She can't get back in, but I do have, but I do have Wi-Fi. Why can't she get back in? Yeah, because we we're closing. Here she comes. Because we we're closing down and it, it, it was going to go in the trash. They wanted us no to rip everything up. No, no portrait studios anywhere. Well, and, one person did come by and take what she could, but I hid a bunch of stuff and kept it because yeah. it was obsolete and I knew they were going to throw yeah. it. There you are, Cindy. Yeah, there what I happened? Am. I don't know. It just went blank or, you know, froze and I couldn't get back on for the longest time. Hmm. Okay. So I found the picture meantime. So. Okay, good. Let's see it. Okay. So that's. Her. Oh, wait, that's the same woman? Mm hmm. Her hairstyle is exact. Well, if you call that a hairstyle. Yeah, I think right. she's, I think she's a one trick pony on the hair. Yeah. She says, I never learned to do my hair. I right. have I have 15 kids. I don't have time for this. Part down the yeah. center and slick it back. Slick yeah. it back and put it in a bun. a bun or something. Yeah, I don't know. What do they tie it with before they had scrunchies and rubber bands? Ribbons. Ribbons, yeah. How could you get a ribbon to tie that tight? Ribbons or pins. Hairpin. Yeah, hmm. I don't know. I used to wear my hair back in a bun with just a stick in it. That's all it took. Well, it was. It would be loose. I lost it. What did I do? Oh, it's there. It's just we're just looking at her eyes and her part in her hair and her ear. You are in screens. Yeah, but I hit something and now it went away on me. That's let's see. She doesn't oh, even have any crows curl lines on her eyes hardly or how many kids did she end up having seven all together two husbands yep at different times <laughs> well. yeah yeah one died before the other okay i'm stopping screen share and i can go back into it Maybe. she's the woman who had the child who had been abducted and raped and murdered right right Husband I mean, died in a mining accident. I was looking to see if there were pins, but I don't know. Her son had a mining accident? No, her husband, her first husband. So the child died one year. The next year, her husband died in a mining accident. And then two years later, she married the guy in the chair. The guy in the chair. <laughs> I don't know else I'm finding. But she's got a necklace on there. She's yeah. again in black. Yeah. So do you know when this picture is taken? Um, my note, my oh, thing below it says 1910 to 1916. I don't know where the 1910 came from in my mind, but 1916 is when she died. And she's got those sleeves that Michaela was talking about where the sleeve cap comes up really high. Yeah. Well, she said, Michaela said that this could have been old. Sleeve enough of the sleeve for sure but she thought maybe 19, 1890 
so she would be out of fashion for yeah. the time period. But, you know, and her husband died in, this was 1910, he died in 1907. She shouldn't still be in black. You wouldn't think so. Wait, when, did, when did when did when um, did Victoria's husband die? Albert. Yeah, because remember, oh, it was eighteen. Wait, wait, I know this. Eighteen before the Civil War. Eighteen before the Civil War. Before eighteen sixty four. Before eighteen sixty one. I think so, because he was writing letters to um, Lincoln Lincoln, and he and he was really sick and he was staying up really late and writing these important letters and he died very soon after that. So, yeah. Who are we talking about? So Prince I, Albert. Well, like what, what, what uh, Michaela was saying is that that was very fashionable what Queen Victoria was doing. Right. Oh. Now she got into mourning and uh, she, she mourned the whole, she stayed, the whole yeah. life. But it, yeah. it, she said it extended the time that people would mourn. So I, traditionally, I guess a person would mourn for six months. But after Prince Albert died and that became yeah. famous, people tended to mourn longer. Like a you year think of uh, Gone with the Wind, Scarlett O'Hara, right? She was supposed mm -hmm. to mourn for a year. Mm -hmm. And then she wore that red dress to the, to the dance. Yeah. How long was she? The scandal, because he hadn't been dead for a year. But you mm. think about it. I was thinking about this the other day. You know, you have a short window of time. You're going to have all these babies and stuff, and, and possibly your life isn't going to live last a long time. So it seems like a woman would not want to mourn for long because she's going to want to get back, get married, and get yeah, married because, again. Quickly. Well, and also, you know, mourning is one thing, but. Um being able to support yourself is another motivator. And if you have young children. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I don't I don't know how she survived the two years in between the death of her coal mining husband and her marriage. Yeah. Now that is really interesting because that to me is like how I mean was yeah. she how I mean, if you own your home, you take in borders, right? That's the, the quickest way to... If you have a place. Yeah, if you own your home. Yeah, I don't know that. I mean, she did have five... Let's see, the other... She had five children, but they were under the age of 12. So she needed... Okay, Prince Albert died 1861. We were on it. Bing! 1861, December. 14th he was 42 really oh my gosh i don't think i remember he was that young yeah and she was really old when she died and all from that period of time on pretty much morning so so if it would seem to me okay if i was a woman with four kids under the age of 12 without a lot of money if it at is, that point at that point five children Okay, so you know, just you're like three years old or so. And your husband was a minor, so you have really no money. Right. right. And they're living in a small community. Right. Okay. Did she have a lot of family to rely on or to live? Did she own? No, they were all back in Scotland <laughs> and England and stuff. With the okay, how about a house? Did they own a house? Or no, they... it was company houses. So when your husband dies, washerwoman? I don't know. Um, I was just there is one brother, Michael, who who um, I could never find in the 1880s census, but in, he was in Rossiter, the small town. Um, no, she was in wait, no, in Barclay, in the western Pennsylvania, eastern Pennsylvania. Um, he also lost a daughter, which is how I figured out that was him. Um, it's a long story, long, but he lost a daughter um, in 1872 or three. Also, um, just normal childhood. Her second loss. husband did? Pardon me? Her second husband? 
No, her brother, sorry, oh. her brother lost and is buried next to the little girl that got raped in Mary's first husband. Um, I'm not sure where he was at that point when, when she lost James. He might have been in Barkley, you know, the little town, but not necessarily. And he probably didn't have any more money either. He was a coal miner. But I suppose it's conceivable he would have lived with Mary since no, he had he had a wife and children. You don't know if they changed locations during that time? No. Well, well they might have moved to one or another little towns, but no, I don't have any way to know that. I have them in the 1880 census. Okay, so so I'm thinking back as I was saying that the you're a woman who's died, you have no money, you're going to be kicked out of your found the company's housing, you have small mm -hmm. children under 12, five of them. Yeah, I wonder how she kept the company. What do housing. you do? I guess oh, the red light, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I give her a child six and seven. Um, I would think you would want to get married as quickly as possible to have somebody provide and to cement it, have more babies with that person. Right. She's still a bearing age so that she can, you know, keep him. So right. did she have more children with the second husband? Or just the one. Just the one. How much, how much after her marriage do you think that she um, had? A little over a year. And did he but have children. Did he have children that he brought into the marriage also? Um, not that I'm aware of. And was he married before? Hmm. That's a good question. Let's see. He would have, well, they would have both been 30 something. I mean, he was, kid, his he was not was quite 38. If he had he kids, have been, huh? is having somebody to take care of the kids. So I need to look for him in the 1870 um, census to see if um, he's somewhere. But he, unfortunately, his name is William Burke, which is in an Irish coal mining area, pretty common. I might have even looked. I don't know, but that's something I could do is look to see if I could find him. Um, hmm. Have you found the census after they were married? Yes. The second one? Yeah. He's, that's the one I, I brought up to class one time. That it's an example of, um, tells her whole story just, just by looking at what's there and what happens when, where it talks about um, that she was born in Ireland and you know her rough age and her children are born in Scotland and they have a different name than she does because she at that point is Burke and there's Tommy Burke, you know, the little boy that's two at that point. Um, but there's, only, says, there's no other Burke kids. No, not with them. And William isn't with them. The, the husband is not in the household with them. Oh. And I, I could not identify him in, you know, again, too many William Burks. So he's not in the household in 1880, but he is with her in 1900. Oh, it's that guy. Okay. I remember them. Yeah. We talked about them. So, I, you know, you could tell when she got married based on the, more or less, based on the birth of her children. You could tell when she immigrated, it's 1900 census, it says so. Um, no, that was the 1880. Um, but you just on where people were born, because her smallest child, not counting Tommy Burke, her smallest McCluskey child was born in the United States. So you had the last one in Scotland and the first one in Ireland, uh, United States. So you, you knew she had to immigrate somewhere in there. That was one of those um, document detective ones we did mm -hmm. and it just you could just see her whole life in that one 1880 census did coal companies at that time did they give a pension or, or anything to have taken care of her especially since he died in at work was there any kind of provisions for 
like a and, widow's widow and orphan yeah and or also something. i'm thinking that maybe there would be records if there had if there's some oh. you would think that that the company would keep some sort of records of Wid and orphans who pension. died in a coal mine and how much they paid him in pension and taking care of him. I mean, you Maybe. wouldn't I, take I, a I, widow I, out of her house that quickly in a company. I mean, that's not like yeah. Yeah, it wasn't she's running a her life. office or something. Yeah. She's going to go, um, especially one with a bunch of kids. And he died in at work. So there should be some kind of pension. But I, I don't know anything about the coal industry, but it seems like well, the my guess is if there is, it's limited. But um, I know I looked in newspapers for it, but yeah, you, you do coal miner, coal mining company records. Because they would have kept something because they got to know if they paid or not paid right. and how much. And then also the community probably would have come together to help oh, yeah. for a while because the how Catholic awful is tragic. This young woman with five kids is did he die alone in the accident or was it a group die? I mean, you know. Oh. No, it was just him, I think, and it was a fall, you know, rock fall kind of thing on him. So then there would be a lot of probably sympathy mm -hmm. to, to the widow. So that's probably how she lasted at least probably. a year or so in, yeah, that, yeah. in that area. They probably didn't kick her out of the house and the community probably came together and there might have been some sort of pension paid yeah. pension or death duties or... What would I you call it? Yeah. Oh. Kind of buying her off. Yeah. Um, for the good of the fact that they wanted to keep other people working there. Still employed. Yeah. You know, yeah. we'll take care of you. We'll take care of your widow if anything happens to you, kind of thing. Right. Um, the oldest boy was 12, I believe, which would make him old enough to work in the mines in the ooh, uh, how awful. Yeah. No. And the what they call it in the pony cart um of that for hey pat hey pat i bet that's what oh, they say yes. more than hey siri or oh, hey alexa oh, wait what do you say to alexa you just say alexa right mm -hmm. hey patrick are you around patrick he's over looking at the barbecue pit i put out in the front of my house probably i hope <laughs> the chair he's sitting in the chair Marco, sit in the chair. It's my dad's chair. I hated getting rid of it, but I really oh. need to go. It's comfortable. But if it was just out in the garage. Yeah, it was in the garage. It's, it's nice, but it's a little too low for me. It'd be perfect for Cindy. It's, it's, it's not a, getting any, you know, it doesn't do it any good just sitting there. Well, I have several other chairs that I'm not parting with. So I said, this one can go. Yeah. Uh, do, where do I take it? If I don't, I take it down to, I don't want to take it to the dump. Don't I take it to the mercantile? Where Last chance mercantile is open, evidently. And yeah, you I can that take it to Goodwill, except for if it's upholstered. Yeah, it's got rips. Yeah, they won't no. take it. Um, do I take it to the mercantile place? I have found them to, although I don't know if they take upholstered furniture, because most oh. of their furniture is like outside. But I have found them to be uh, the most willing to take stuff that other places won't take. So here's Patrick, who's going to give me a drop and tell you everything a 12-year-old boy could do with the mind. Will there be a His mouth full of food. <laughs> should I be, should I? Then we should probably end this. Session. Should I take a note? So do you know anything about Last Chance Mercantile, if they would take that chair I have outside? They might. I don't know. It's I got mean, a holster and it's kind of got some rips on it. My cat went scratching it. Yeah, they're open. Um, they op re just recently reopened. Yeah. But I've never been there, so I don't know. Oh, you really have it? I don't oh, know what, wild. what their supply of stuff is right now, but it's really interesting. Um, I, I need something for my backyard. I need a big outdoor table. Maybe they would have something there. Oh, that would be a good place because yeah. literally all that kind of stuff is just outside on the on the on the pavement. Yeah, you know, office chairs, office, um, you know, filing cabinets, desks, skis. It's very well organized there. Yeah, they've got bins that they just yeah. kind of put, you know, 
Now, where is this again? Is it on out at the, the landfill, the marina landfill off of the very end of the north end of Del Monte? So if you go out to one, if you like go through Castroville to one and go down one and then get off on Del Monte and cross the freeway, then when you when you go there, and that actually is the beginning of Del Monte, if you can believe what? it. Tamarine. It goes into Marina, but there's no, a left hand turn Tamarine. that takes it's you to the I Marina know. Dump or the whatever, uh, Monterey Peninsula. And if you go out like past all the flower fields, probably a mile or two. And it's hold, it's hold on a second, down. I gotta take a call. There's a, a dump and then the mercantile. Tamerly, she needs to make yeah. take a call, she said. Well, why don't you tell me everything that the kid can do and then we can pass it on to their man. Sure, I know everything they can do. Well, with something about the pony cart or the... Yeah, it's okay. They, they've been gossiping the whole time. They've been gossiping, but we did talk about the fact that I chatted with Michaela. Mm -hmm. and she so was. Where, where is uh, Deirdre? Sorry, Deirdre. Uh, we, well, Deirdre is in Tahoe. We remembered, somebody remembered that. Uh, I don't know where Mary is. Also, Robles? Hmm? No, Tahoe. Tahoe. Yeah. Lake Tahoe. Okay, and so let's hear. Pat's going to tell us about a coal mining child. Yeah. We better come back. We're waiting for you to come back. Okay, I'm here. Okay. Okay. What, what can the kids do in the mines? I'm not real positive about what they could do, but I know that there were, there were kids as young as eight Oh, can you imagine? Uh, we were working at the tipple. But now the tipple is where the coal gets sorted out when it gets out of the mines. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the bad coal gets kicked one way and the good coal kicks it another way. And then there's the coal cars move in underneath the tipple and that coal is it's poured into the coal cars. I know that as young as eight, there were kids worked at the tip. Was this outside? Because you're saying the coal's already pulled out? Yeah, the coal's already out of the mine. So they're outside. The will come out. You know, not all coal is good coal. Some of it has uh, earth in it, and some of it, you know, has other defects. So they don't, they don't want to be selling that to, and that goes to the bony. Uh, where it burned the bad coal the bad coal yeah it burned it so uh, yeah they call it the bony dump or the bony pile and the one in rossiter was a, a, a small mountain but i don't know what it was like in, in other uh, areas but those eight years, when, as young as eight, they were working there. Now, my grandfather went to work underground when he was 12 years old. He worked, he worked with his father. Um, I'm not sure whether that would be James or Bill. Bill is work. Um, because I, I can't, can't, I don't know how the ages was. But he worked. He, it would be Billy Burke. Huh? It would have to be Billy okay, Burke. So he, he worked under underground with his stepfather. And at that time, the, the kids that were working there didn't get paid, but the fathers did. So it was kind of a piece rate thing. How, much, how many tons can you can you ship? And uh, they got paid that way, and it went it went to the to the father, supposedly to be used by the family. They had to buy their own 
their own uh, equipment, you know, shovels and things that they used in mines. So if you need if you needed a pick, you'd go to the company store, buy a pick at the at the price that the company store wanted. You go on your tab. That's why you hear as many stories about oh my oh my soul to the company store. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 16 tons and what do you got? Yeah. Now later on, I know my grandfather did work uh, uh, as a pony driver because the coal cars ran on tracks like railroad tracks that they would install and these pit ponies would pull those those carts out now they were nowhere near as big as a as the uh, rail car they they were fairly small and I think that they could be made to chain together so you, you might be pulling two or three cars at once out of there because th these are slope mines so to get the, the, the cars out they'd have to pull them uphill so and these these were little Shetland type ponies were there because they they fit I don't know about using mules or burrows all I know is that in Rossiter they use pit, pit ponies and they needed a smaller boy to drive to ride them. Oh, so yeah. cheap. But somebody cheap, yeah. So well, so what about like in Mary Murray's case, after James died, she has like a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old boy, something like that. What could they do without their father? I don't know. It probably went to work in the in the tipple. In the tipple. Uh, I don't think they went underground, but I don't know. Could they? They would have. They, they would have been paid. They would have been paid. Uh, they probably had lived with some adults, and the adults got paid. I don't think the kids got paid. We're just trying to figure out how Mary survived for the two years. Oh, ask them about the pension. Pardon? For oh. each. When the guy dies, when her husband dies, her first husband dies in a coal mining accident, he falls and he's by himself. It's not like a, a whole group of people dying. She's living in a company house. Would they have, so she doesn't marry again for two years and she's got five kids under the age of 12. Would the company have paid some kind of death duty, allowing her no to benefits. On her? No benefits. That's that's why they end up having to buy their own tools and what have you. So she, if she, if her husband dies, well, when her husband dies in this accident in the coal mine, mm -hmm. she's out of luck. Nobody gives her a pension. Nobody. No. They don't evict her out of the house right away. Got to go right? find a husband. Yeah. Wow. Free American labor uni unionization, right? Can you? I can't that's, even that's, imagine. One of the reasons why the unions got a foothold in the, in the right. coal fields early on, when union when the unions uh, began to form. In fact, there was a, a coal mining strike, and I'm not sure the dates, but 1920s. I think it was 1920, yeah, 1920s, 27, something like that. And um, Pat's grandfather was a supervisor at that point, so he didn't go on strike, but some members of the family did, and they lost their jobs when the strike was over. So it didn't win? They didn't win? No, no they, they did not win. They did not win. So Pat's, um, let's see, Pat's grandmother's brother definitely lost his job after the coal mining strike, lost it during the strike. And then never got hired after. And then the depression yeah, comes Tommy a few years later. In both. Tommy Boyce also. Okay. Din is the one I was. Wow! Thinking of. What a mess. Yeah. We take mm -hmm. so much for granted now. Mm -hmm. And, and do, do you think that without some of the protections that we mm -hmm. have in the law today, that we wouldn't have the same mess out there in the right. industry? Let's look. Look at the uh, steel things. 
like the Homestead mine outside, or, uh, yeah. Homestead steel plant outside of Pittsburgh, where uh, uh, see who 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 is that guy? Uh, can't remember the name. Uh, Carnegie? Huh? Carnegie? Well, Carnegie's uh, oh, yeah. help. Uh, yeah, the second in command there. Who was a uh, Frick? Frick was Frick. his name. Yeah. He brought in a private police force to, because the, the workers in the fact are in the yeah in the factory kind of went on a sit down strike, and they just plain shot them. Yep. So it, it was not a good situation. And that, you know, all those things led to uh, better working conditions in the long run, usually by the, by the law, because they, the business owners weren't very good at about taking care of their employees. Their attitude was, well, there's more on the line out there. Yeah. And there wasn't another job that somebody could necessarily get. I mean, was there any, I mean, there must have been something. What What could somebody do for a living? Well, remember that in those coal mining towns, the coal company owned the town. They built the buildings. Oh. They built the, they built the roads and whatever, water system mm -hmm. or whatever you needed. They, and all, all those miners were renting from the coal company. So if you got your job, if you lost your job, you lost they're your not going to hire you in the company store either. No, no. no. But I no. think he did get a job working in the post office. I think. Yeah, well, that was a government job. But that was a government federal yeah. job. So I think right. he worked in the post office because one of the other, his sister, her sister-in-law worked there. Wow. But generally, if you lost if you lost your job, you lost your housing. You did better move on, find someplace else. Oh, well, there's a lot. Watch out for your reputation. A lot of history in Pat's family. Wow. And what city was this in? City? Ross. <laughs> Ross and Orbit Hardly a city. It was a suburb of Punxsutawney. <laughs> <laughs> a suburb of Puxatani. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty small. Yeah. So that's why they invented that groundhog story. They got that groundhog story so, so there'd be some income in that yeah. town. Tourism. So they're actually in two separate counties, but they're only like, I don't know, 10 miles apart or less. Yeah. So how close is this to Mary and her family? Other side of the country or the state. It's this is in western Pennsylvania. Where she is is in eastern Pennsylvania. Well, and, she's not in Pennsylvania. Very yeah, her, her family's her in family. North she's North in North Carolina, Carolina. northeastern yeah. Pennsylvania. Um, that's actually it's sort of close to where Pat's family was in those good old days of deaths and mining accidents and stuff. Old, and that yeah, second marriage, days. um, and that that was in Barkley, Crawford, or is it Crawford County? Doesn't seem right. But anyway, that's in, in north eastern Pennsylvania. And then they moved and they went to western Pennsylvania. I found Pennsylvania. And they moved on Moss. So there. Punxsutawney is a huge place, way bigger than I thought. What's it say? Well, I'm looking at it on a map, and I've seen Groundhog Day like yeah. a million times. So right. I thought it was much smaller. Oh, it's pretty small. It's, it's small. I mean, let me look it up on it. But you know, hundred yeah, years. Look, look at the censuses and see well, how big she, the She's going to look on. I'm going to look on Wikipedia just to see what the town size is. It, it's. A, I wouldn't think it's five thousand people. Okay, it's not as big as I thought. Yeah, five thousand. Yeah. No, it's really small compared to our standard. What's the time? How big is uh, Gonzalez? Yeah, how big is Gonzalez? I don't I know, but like I think it's bigger than uh, Punxsutawney. Punxsutawney might have been, although Punxsutawney had a, a looked like a thriving downtown. Yeah, it might might have been bigger a while ago. 
Okay, so Gonzalez has at the last population count eight thousand people. So you're right; yeah. it's bigger than it's uh, Punxsutawney, smaller than Gonzalez. And that's with Gonzalez all built up like it is now. Imagine a hundred years ago. Yeah. What What was the 1900 census for Punxsutawney? Wow, I don't know, but I'm looking at the. Wow. Eight thousand people. I mean, 5,000 people. And so Rossiter was much smaller. I mean, you know, to comparison to Punxsy. That was going into the- oh, Was that what they called it, Punxsy? Yeah. Punxsy, yeah. yeah. So. And they were, they, they, they were what they called the Y, which was where the railroad track uh, or part of the railroad track turn, turned off and went down to Rossiter, and part of it kept on going, depending on wh which way you go. Part of it would go to probably Indiana, and if you, get, if you went one way, over to Punxsy in another way. But they used to walk down to the Y to catch the train to go to Punxsy, right? Yeah, yeah. something was like that. Yeah. I found Gobbler's Knob, but it's not in town. I thought it was in town. They probably bring the. What? What are you Gobbler's saying? No Gobbler's Knob. Yeah. Part of the movie. Yeah. I thought it was like a little area in the town. It was a town square, but they've got it. It's outside the town square. You got to drive to it. It's not close. It's a museum. Mm -hmm. So maybe Gobbler's Knob is, has nothing to do with the groundhog. No, it, oh, it does. It does. Uh, I think that, uh, well, the, that in the Punxsy Library, there is a, a place where the where the uh, uh, groundhog. Was it? The, the, I want to say beaver. It's not a beaver. It's a uh, where the groundhog lives. Is is in a in a glassed in area in the in the uh, library. So tourists can come and, and see it. Huh. Yeah, this Gobbler's Knob it is a tourist attraction. They've got all kinds of, I mean, it's, it's out in the outskirts. It's got tons mm -hmm. of things you can take pictures with. It's got like it all set up and everything for, for the Groundhog's Day. I mean, it's quite clever. You think about a town that maybe didn't have a lot going for it yeah. came up with this idea mm -hmm. and it's a massive tourist uh, well maybe not tourist but oh, yeah. marketing thing and at a time of the year february 2nd who's who's really hopping over it <laughs> <laughs> oh, i want to go to philadelphia <laughs> i want to go to uh, pennsylvania for punxsutawney punxsutawney phil yeah, it's it's an interesting idea. I I think there's all sorts of PhDs written on people who've done um, economic studies of tourism of the ideas. I know like Loch Ness, the uh, the amount of money that is raised from the the Loch Ness monster mm -hmm. idea. They say there's lots of great places to go to. Loch Ness is nothing special. It, it but you know it's one yeah. out all of the other. Yeah. They, I, I read a, a, a dissertation, a PhD dissertation on haunted houses once. You know, you would think that that would be a bad thing. Nobody wants to own a haunted house, but actually they would, you know, it was a marketing thing. You wanted to get sure. something that had a reputation and you would, if you're, especially if you're turning it into an inn or a, a restaurant or something like that, there's a lot of money in ghosting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very interesting. Saw, oh, there's Sawmill Run. I feel like I'm, wow. I gotta watch that movie again now. Huh, you ought to go to Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, went, we went to Pennsylvania one time and they, there's been a, there lots of times, a but... living museum. Kind of, a, I think you call it a living museum that would take you on tours underground into the mine. Oh, yeah. that was really interesting. 
Well, my dad yeah. remembers as a kid around Pittsburgh playing in the deserted mine shafts because they weren't, there wasn't a law at the time that you had to um, seal them. Oh, huh. So they were just as kids, little boys playing in the woods and stuff. And their great thing was to go in the old abandoned mines. Yeah, well, I, I was very firmly instructed to never go in there. Oh, I'm sure he was too. <laughs> he <had great> <laughs> Oh, I didn't realize how close this is to Cleveland. Wow. What? Just it's Pennsylvania. Right. I, I really oh, yeah. haven't thought about it. Oh, yeah. It's right the there. Thing. See, so Pat has a high school reunion or had, I'm not sure what's happening now, but every five years in Zanesville, Ohio, which is kind of in the south. Mm -hmm. it's southeast. Southeast part of, of Ohio. So we'd go there and then we'd add to the trip. And then we also had that road trip in, in 2010. So we, between all that, done lots of our genealogy explorations because he's got all of Pennsylvania and I've got Ohio and Michigan and some New York. And, you know, we've just been lots of, and he has Ohio. I so just found been, Zanesville. It is on the road to Columbus. Yeah. Yeah, it's about 50 miles yep. east of Columbus. Yeah, so on the old national road, seventy. Yep, it's Interstate seventy now, but it used to be the old. It was national one of the road. first roads, road, hot, roads in the country. Uh, intended, I, I just was going to refer to it as a highway, but it was far from a highway. So it's one of the things was I was going to talk about when I talk about travel. I'll show you a picture of where it went. It's are we really, doing that next week? Is travel? Well, I don't know. We didn't get very far in anything else this week, but oh, maybe we covered a ton today. You you watch this video. Chamberlain and I covered a lot, not just raccoon stories. No, I you did genealogy too. We talked about yeah, we did show and tell, huh? No, we did. You watch. You'll be proud of us. Okay. All I right. promise you all. Okay. And then so all next right. week, um, Mary hopefully will be back. Deirdre, you'll be back. Maybe Mary yeah. or something. I don't know. I, I kind of would like um, to do the travel. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Our, that was very interesting. Our historical reference. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. I don't have, as far as I know, I don't have coal mining much in our family history. So no, I don't but we were talking about how did Mary survive those two yeah. years. It's hard to say. Yeah. I was thinking I'm that maybe the town Mary might have took pity on her and, and she got a lot of help from people you know food and yeah that's in the church people do washing or them. something and yeah well and she got married two years later so maybe she was courting him for a while yeah and you said he was he was he had a child right no she with her oh so he didn't have any children before he that married. i know of but i i don't know that you don't know I, if he would, had been married before I don't know. Was he and a minor I, also? I heard any reference. Yeah, I've never heard any reference. And the one biography of him in the Grand Army of the Republic kind of book doesn't say anything about any other wife and family. And I think I did try to find him in the 1870 census and it was just too hard to- Was he a minor? Him. Yeah, he was. It seems so he like could a have been around old, in the area. He would have been an old man to have not married anybody. I know. But I don't know. Maybe he was an immigrant. Well, I'll have to look that up and see. And because because I do have him in the 1900 census and see if it says when he immigrated. Yeah, that would be very interesting. Or whether he was born. And the one kid. child they had was a boy girl. Was what? A boy or girl? Boy, Tommy Burke, who was a had a wonderful singing voice, and I have some of his sheet music right here. Oh, so and he had Mary. children and descendants, and no, he died in uh, flu epidemic. Nineteen eighteen. Yeah. Yeah. How old would yeah. he have been? Twenty something like that. Let's see. No, 30 something. He was born in 78. So if he, so he would have probably been too old to have gone to World War One when that started. 
I think he didn't. Um, he was an ambulance driver, so maybe he was a pacifist, or maybe he got excused. You're asking me questions I hadn't thought of. I will have to look him up there too. I'm not a social no, historian. Ever. I want to know all the gossip. <laughs> but you know, you can you you could register for the draft and not serve. Right. Yeah, not everybody was taken. War. Especially World War One. Not every male um, had to go to yeah. World War Two or to go to um, yeah. in World War One. Yeah, I'll have to look him up. You just have to register. Yeah. And then your number might come up. Yeah, there would be World War One draft cards, obviously, for him. Yeah, I hadn't out. thought of that. Cindy, I, I, I think, we, I think we're that. about to break Cindy. I know. <laughs> my, um, my lunch should be arriving, so I guess I should go because at four. Okay, and Zoom. you got your Thursday night thing too. Yep, yep. I'm busy. So. Well, Thursdays are. I, I yesterday I worked like like a dog yesterday. Had to take two showers. I was sweaty, <laughs> sweaty, sweaty. Had to use like clothespins to take off like a tongs to take off the clothes off of me. I was so oh. messy and dusty, oh. spider webby and stuff. And then so I said. Tomorrow is Thursday. I'm doing nothing in the yard. It's all online. I'm sitting at my computer eating like a pig. And then on Friday, I'm starting up again. And so if you guys want to come by tomorrow and see the crazy stuff, but I want to go by this mercantile place. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah, afraid to go. I might come home with stuff I shouldn't. Well, there's that too. Yeah. It's Susan, it's also a place where you can get rid of um, uh, half empty paint cans and things like that. They'll take paint um old you know fertilizers old any kind of you know household chemical stuff and put it in put it up for sale so other people can buy it instead of it going into the recycling okay. and hazmat and i've got their website open here and it's i i think i don't want to take my chair them. down there they're they're um now they're managed by the veterans transition center where they didn't used to be so i don't know what all has changed and there might not be as much stuff because they've been closed so long for people to yeah. bring things. I have, I have out in the front, if it doesn't get taken today, I have big rolls of, of the tar paper you put on the roof before you put the shingles. I've got a yeah, big that paper for that. And that I've got a, some other kind of laminate stuff out there too. Maybe I will take that. They probably take that kind of stuff. It's or a Habitat for Humanity out at Fort Ord will take that. We'll take the, the tar paper and building materials. Okay. Well, I do need to find a table for outside of my uh, window here. And I that would be another place for a table too, would be Habitat. And I have never heard of this Habitat for Humanity in, in locally. Yeah, yeah. They, um, the Monterey one is uh, in the old movie theater next to the PX on Fort Ord. So if you look at where the PX and the commissary are off of Light Fighter and uh, General Jim Moore. Yeah, I had no idea this was here. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, wait, that's Santa Cruz. Where is Monterey? Let's see. Oh, Restore, Mon Restore Monterey on yep. Giggling Road. Yep. And that's open, you think? Yeah, yeah, that's been open for months. So maybe I'll go do that tomorrow because I'm curious now. I don't want to go over on the weekend probably be too busy but day anyway okay so cindy i did record a bunch of stuff so you, i think you'll find it interesting i think you're gonna okay. want to talk you'll start talking to the screen thinking we're there yeah she'll say will those girls ever shut up no <laughs> we're gonna get a netflix documentary i did a podcast with a with somebody in the philippines a couple days ago yesterday two days ago and it was a paranormal podcast so i didn't know what they were going to say but it was a wonderful interview i haven't had an interview that well in a long time but he'd gone into depth and looked into my stuff he said before i interviewed you i had to go and check you out and find stuff and he says yeah. as i'm looking at you on facebook he says i realized that i'm doing what it is you accuse the psychics of doing going into people's personal history and finding out information and repeating it yeah. back to them mm -hmm. so he thought it was kind of funny that that uh, he was doing that and he says it's so easy to find anything and mm -hmm. um but it was interesting because he was reading through things i'd done and telling me oh this article you wrote or i watched this video and i thought well 
somebody somewhere is probably watching my videos of me doing these genealogy things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! They can watch me compost. This guy in a basement with two long fingernails and Cheeto stains on his fingers. <laughs> somebody out there has got a wall of pictures of me with with like string bright yeah. one yeah. to the other making the connections yeah. of actually yeah. of Thera, Thera Fawcett and Susan Grubick all <laughs> <in the world. laughs> you never saw them in the same room together have you <laughs> no they must be <laughs> one in the same yeah, they might, yep. or it's a, yeah anyway okay I'm gonna go okay, okay so I'll, email I'll, you guys I'll talk about travel next okay bye